to state their name and address if they'd like to speak as well. So Holly, let me know when you're ready. I'm ready. All right, Holly's ready. So that means it's time to begin the meeting and welcome to the May 26th, 2020 City Council meeting. And before we get started, the first thing we really need to do is we need to have a motion for consideration and possible action regarding suspending our rules as far as being physically present for the city council meetings. And I would entertain a motion to do that. So moved. Second. So motion by Johnson. Is there a second? Yes, Hiley. Uh, second by Hiley. All right, and the reason we need to do this is our emergency order only lasted for 60 days. And believe it or not, we've, we've reached that um, and I know this will be a subject that we'll be speaking more about and eventually at Community Affairs Council policy. So basically what we're doing for tonight is suspending the rules, which will allow us to have this meeting virtually. Um, any questions or comments? No. Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That carries. Thank you very much. Um, next item is the roll call, Holly. Forsma. Here. Caravello. Here. Doom. Doom. Riley. Here. Hirsch. Here. Hunt. Here. Jensen. Here. Ladaki. Here. Mayaski. Here. Reeves. Here. Riley. Here. Schumacher. Here. And then is Alder Doom here yet? Yes, I had my mic off. Sorry, Holly, I'm here. Oh, okay, that's okay. There are 12 Alders present. All right, thank you. Um, next item of business is uh, Stoughton City Council um, 2020 um, goals and initiatives. And I think all the uh, Council President Hirsch wants to speak to this one. Sure. Um, I think we're trying to go into the tradition that actually Mayor Swadley started a few years ago when he was Council President and um, past president Majewski started uh, continued the last couple of years is that you know we've all been on a number of these committees and on council for a while except for Fred and welcome Fred and we've thought about and we've talked about uh, looking at different ordinances and changing them or policies or what have you and we've talked about it so what we're asking is that you to write down things that you would like to work on this year whether it's in the committee that you're in or not and we'll get it to the appropriate committee and so that we can have a year of action this year like we did a few years ago where we really got a lot done because people elders really identified things that they wanted to work on things that they thought needed to be improved things that need to be changed um, for instance, I've been hearing, like when we were talking about the wetlands uh, at Kettle Park West a couple of weeks ago, some of you guys chimed in and said it would be really nice to have a wetland or ordinance. Well, let's work on that. Um, one of you also have said over the years, you know, they don't like the way retention ponds are built and how that is an eyesore. So let's, you know, revisit how retention ponds are approved there's a lot of new and different communities throughout wisconsin that they're doing a more natural looking retention pond so it serves as an ecological um resource as well as a retention pond others um had told me that they'd like to revisit you know the fluoride in our water you know and then also how do we interface with the school board so there's all these different things that people have said over the past couple of years. Let's write everything down that you've been talking about or use in your campaign promises and send Holly and I a list of things that you would like to work on this year. 
um, I think it could be a really cool year if people we start putting our heads together and really changing things and helping our leadership team change things for the better of our community. So if by next meeting, if you guys can just send Holly and I an email with your ideas of what you'd like to improve, what some of your goals are, some initiatives you'd like to start, send them to us. And that's about it. All right, any questions from any council members? Okay, hearing none. Um, next, we have uh, an update from uh, Director Ramsey from the library. And Jim, the floor is yours. All right, thank you. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Yes. Good. All right, uh, I will be brief because I know you have a full agenda, but I appreciate uh, the opportunity to address the council. Um, I know all of you on the council, most of you know me, but uh, for those of you uh, who are here and don't know me, my name is Jim Ramsey. I'm the director of the Stoughton Public Library, have been uh, for about a year. So um, I was talking to the mayor a week before last, and uh, he thought it might be a good idea for me to just uh, address the council, talk about the library, how we've been dealing with the present situation, and uh, as much as possible, sketch out what our plans are for the future. Um, so. I just want to start out by reviewing the timeline of the library's response to the COVID-19 crisis, talk about the library services that we've been able to provide during this time and where we are now. And then, like I said, look a little bit at the future. Um, this pandemic is difficult for everyone. Um, if, as, far, as far as libraries are concerned, it's especially difficult because many of the services and functions that we consider central to our mission as a public place have been rendered unsafe for the time being. Um, normally, we promote the library as a place to gather, place to meet, place for people to learn new things, meet their neighbors, exchange ideas and information, kind of town square. Um, our building is set up to encourage people to linger, uh, to meet with others in small or large groups, and uh, to attend programs, both large and small. All of these things will absolutely happen again, but for the foreseeable future, our building and our services are going to look quite different. As you know, uh, we decided on, um, well, I decided on March 13th to close the library to the public, effective uh, the Sunday, March 16th. Um, we started that week of March 9th out, um, like everybody else, just kind of waiting and watching, realizing that this um, cases of COVID-19 were increasing locally and around the country. Um, but things moved very quickly that week. We went from canceling our programs to uh, to closing our doors within the space of a few days. Um, this is not a decision that I took lightly. The job of the public library is to serve the public, to be open to the public, and to provide the community with access to information. Um, but in this unprecedented health emergency, I felt that this was the best course of action and that decisive action was needed. So um, luckily our library board had created a policy um, called the epidemic and health emergency policy uh, to deal with a situation like this. So I was able to use that policy to guide my decisions during this time. So in the early days of the closure, most staff continued to report for duty. Um, but as the orders from health officials became more and more strict, um, we eliminated most of the staff in the building, um, save for myself and a few managers coming in uh, to take care of things and there we kind of stayed until um the amended safer at home order on april 16th that allowed for curbside pickup and uh so while we prepared to start offering curbside pickup of library materials um we we did that while still still adhering to social distancing guidelines uh curbside pickup went live on may 4th and we've done over 400 pickups since then um so the way it works is people call us or they place a hold through the library website and then uh, we pull the hold they get notified uh, usually by email that it's available and then um, they call us and arrange a time to pick up their holds so uh, we've been hearing from a lot of people that they're very grateful to have this service uh, back and we're happy to provide it we originally envisioned doing this three days a week but quickly expanded to six days a week monday through saturday uh, to accommodate demand uh, since the closure, many members of our staff have been working from home. Um, many on our staff are providing virtual programming. Um, our children's librarian, Amanda Bosky, 
and our children's intern have been creating story times and other activities for kids. Um, our teen librarian, Cynthia Schlegel, and her intern have been hosting virtual book clubs and weekly meetups for young people. Um, for some of our staff, especially those involved in providing service um, at our service desks and in handling library materials, working from home has not been an option. Their daily tasks depend on a steady flow of people and library materials uh, through the building. Our library substitutes those staff members who fill in as needed in our service desks and allow other staff members to do things like programming um, have been essentially furloughed um, because we don't we don't have work for them with the library with the building closed. Um, with the addition and now the startup of curbside uh, pickup, we have uh, all staff now working in the library in some capacity, with the exception of the library shelvers. Um, though this closure of the building has meant reduced hours and reduced workloads for some. Uh, staff have been reassigned to other tasks where possible, and we've even taken on tasks in other departments. I know several of us are still delivering for Meals on Wheels, and uh, another group of us did yard work um, for the Senior Center through the Helping Hands program. So we've been trying to, to help out and, and pitch in wherever, wherever needed. Um, it's going to be a long, slow road back to uh, some kind of normal. Um, but I feel that the more deliberate we are, ultimately, the quicker we'll be able to return uh, to normal, to turn that dial, um, which brings me to the future, which is the last part of, of my little talk here. So I appreciate you bearing with me. Um, though a lot's still uncertain, we've been planning almost from the beginning for the day when we might be able to reopen our doors to the public. And to guide us in turning the dial back to a new normal, we've been using a document from the Department of Public Instruction um, called the Guidelines for Reopening Wisconsin Public Libraries. Um, for those of you who don't know, the Department of Public Instruction, the DPI, the same um, department that oversees the public schools, also oversees the uh, 16 libraries, public library systems in the state. Um, this document is described by the DPI as a living document subject to continuous revision, but it lets us know and gives us a guide uh, so we know which library services are available or which library services we can provide at different levels of the Badger Bounce Back program and now also, as you know, through the Forward Dane program. So with Dane County entering phase one uh, today of the Forward Dane plan, libraries in the county are preparing to partially reopen, albeit at 25% capacity and with limited spaces and services. We don't yet have a date set for a partial reopening, but we hope to determine that in the coming weeks. I've also been meeting regularly with directors in Dane County of other public libraries. Um, and though each public library is independent, governed by its own board of trustees, we are aiming for some level of coordination among libraries when it comes to resuming services. Um, virtual programming that I already mentioned, our online story times, our summer reading program that will be conducted almost entirely online, uh, meetings of book groups. Um, I'm working with UW right now to put together some lectures by UW professors that we were going to have here at the library, but not, we're now going to broadcast on WSTO and make available for streaming. So uh, we're adapting. Uh, we're adapting our programs uh, to meet the, the current situation. Um, in considering our reopening plan, our top priority is going to be staff and patron safety. Our turning of the dial is going to be deliberate, decisive, measured, and appropriately cautious. We're going to constantly evaluate the situation and pay attention to data and recommendations by state and local health authorities. Our plan, of course, is to gradually increase services bit by bit when it is safe to do so, Always mindful, of course, that we might have to uh, pull back if the situation changes. When we partially reopen, our buildings and our services will look very different for a while, um, but our core values will be the same. Um, education, literacy, free access to information, free exchange of ideas, the preservation of our community's history, and cultural heritage, and the creation and fostering of community. Um, my main takeaway that I want you to, uh, or that, that I'd like you to take away from this is uh, the more careful we are now, the more deliberate we are now, um, and the more planning and deliberation that we conduct in these early stages, the quicker we'll be able to return to normal. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions that any of you might have about the library and our operations at this time. 
Um, that's it. Okay, thank you, Jim. Are there any questions from council members? Okay, thank you very much. Here and none, we'll move on to our next agenda item. And the minutes and reports are in the packet. So the next item would be a public comment period. And I do have a few people signed up for a public comment tonight. And I'll try to unmute as I can. Um, it looks like the first one is Jessica Royko. And just give me a moment and I'll unmute you, Jessica, and then you can speak. And just Mayor remember Sally, that. Yes. I, I think Jessica signed up for the public hearing for the special assessments, if I'm. Oh, okay. Right? Okay. Yes. Okay. All right, thank you for clarifying that. So I have uh, two others uh, set to speak for public comment period. I have uh, Carol Clark, and I believe Carol called in, so I'm not really sure um, which caller she is. So I'm going to unmute a few people here, and then hopefully uh, we'll figure out if Carol is on the line here. I'm on the line, and I. I actually wanted to address the quick trip and I, I have the councilman have my, I sent it by email to them, my comments. Okay. Also to Mr. Shield, Shield and the mayor. All right. And so you have three minutes to speak and then, uh, we, this isn't a conversation, it's just an opportunity for you to speak. So there really won't be any, um, you know, back and forth, but certainly some of the questions or comments that you have may be addressed later. So whenever you're ready, uh, you can go ahead. I got all the information that I could from the city, the previous city council meetings have surveyed a lot of people in our neighborhood close to in vicinity to the new location for the quick trip. And what I've noticed is that there's a lot of people here that really are against building. And there's many, many already conditions that are required, but I've added a bunch more that I think really are important for that busy intersection. That you, okay. I would really like, I really would like it better. So I put them on the screen so the council members, if they didn't see them in their email, they can certainly take a look at them. Um, but you can certainly speak to a few uh, for your three minutes. Actually, that says it all. Okay. All right. So you have nothing else to add? No, thank you. But thank you for okay. yeah, considering. I, no, we appreciate uh, you taking the time to put this document together. Uh, we have two items that are on for uh, the agenda tonight that we'll speak to, and then there will also be a discussion at a future plan commission meeting. So we'd certainly invite you to tune in for that one as well. So do you ever put out flyers to people to notify them about these meetings and when something that's going to be significant to your neighborhood, it would have been nice if we would have gotten previous um, notification of this other than tuning into a city council meeting that we didn't even know was being it was being addressed at i can just tell you quickly that we have an ordinance and i believe that we notify residents within, within 300, 300 feet 300 feet is not adequate that was two houses that's something else that the city council could take under consideration going that would forward. be a great idea all right thank you very much anything else you want to add oh, you're welcome thank you all right. Have a good night. Okay. Uh, Mayor, can Mayor, uh, can you hear me? This is Riley. I've been speaking, but I'm not. I didn't get a response. I can hear you now, and I'm okay. Gonna, good. Yeah. All right. Then I'm, I'm good. Thank you. Move on. Thank okay. You. All right. And the next person I have signed up is Brad. Uh, and I'll see. Oh, looks like Brad is. I just have to unmute you.
And maybe Brad, did you mute yourself? I might have there. Can you hear me yeah, now? Go ahead. You have three minutes. Thanks for coming tonight. Okay, thank you. Um, I just want to uh, talk in support of of uh, Carol Clark. Um, there are 40 homes down in this area, and uh, she has gone and talked to people in every one of those homes. Um, no one is real happy about this quick trip being up there, at least the way it's been situated and what they're doing. Our big concern uh, in, in a meeting from April 29th of 2020, uh, in a paragraph, they talked about the conditional use and it says it does not re result in a substantial or undue adverse impact on nearby properties, the character of the neighborhood, environmental factors, traffic factors, uh, rights of way, uh, if if we don't if you don't believe that it's going to affect the traffic in that area, then you've never seen or been by a, a quick trip, obviously, because it is going to affect the traffic in that area. That intersection is not designed such that putting something in that area is going to um, it's going to create congestion. It's going to create some unsafe conditions. My other concern is basically got to do with uh, routing commercial traffic onto a residential street. Mm -hmm. uh, Cedar Brook, which is the street that they plan to use to put uh, egress traffic from their location, uh, the traffic will only exit coming out of there going north on end. Anyone want to going north, uh, south on end, anyone wanting to get back to 51 is going to have to come out on Cedar Brook. Uh, this is going to create an awful lot of traffic on Cedar Brook, which is which is a residential street. Um, my suspicion is the reason that this was done was that uh, Quick Trip didn't want to have to worry too much about getting out on the N or out on the 51. I know that that would be uh, a big problem for them, uh, that uh, trying to route traffic on the 51 was going to put them in a pinch with uh, the state trying to deal with the state. Uh, but I think having that traffic coming out on the 51 or onto uh, Cedar Brook is a pretty poor uh, way to to make traffic go through there. Um, all 40 of these houses, most of them have to come out onto Cedar Brook to get on to end to get out of our, resi our residential area. It's going to create a, a big mess there. And then people turning off of Cedar Brook on to end going south, uh, it's going to be a real issue because there's a hill right below that. It's sort of a blind spot. So I believe that uh, Carol's uh, delineation of her, her conditions uh, address some of those. But if it was at all possible, figure out a different way to handle the traffic coming out of there, uh, it would be awfully nice to see that done. That's basically all I have. All right, thank you for joining us tonight. We appreciate your feedback. Great, thank you. Uh, okay, the next item is uh, our consent agenda. And there are several, um, Items in the consent agenda I would entertain a motion to approve. It. Move to approve. Second. Set. Motion by Hiley, a second by Jensen. Would anybody like anything removed from the consent agenda? We have minutes, we have citizens' appointments to committees, we have operator license, and we have uh, items from Stone Utilities. Hearing none, all in favor of the consent agenda say aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed, that carries. Um, next item is the um, is the public hearing to consider special assessments for improvement of curb and gutter, retaining walls, sidewalks, driveway, aprons, carriage walks, drainage improvements. Sewer constructions, hand railings, sanitary sewer, and water main extensions for the 2020 projects. And as I mentioned before, I think we 
had one person signed up, and that was uh, Jessica Royko. And if I can find Jessica again, I'll unmute her. And uh, is there anything you want to cover, Rodney, before we go into the public comment part of the? I can go over the three segments if we wanted to talk about each section that's covered in this, or that's included in the packet if if they're comfortable with it being in the packet. Council have a preference. I'm comfortable with what's in the packet. I am as well. Okay, and perhaps some questions will come up as we go through this. So I'll uh, close the regular meeting yeah. and then reopen the public hearing. And then uh, Jessica, uh, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you. So I, uh, in fairness, I only found out about what I'm going to talk about an hour ago, but um, I, my understanding is that my neighbors on McKinley Street are going to be getting a sidewalk. And I attended a meeting, I don't know, the initial meeting where we kind of, you probably all remember, lots of people from the neighborhood came out and spoke uh, against altering this historic neighborhood. I know there was a vote and it was agreed at that time that a one size fits all approach would not be imposed on our neighborhood. Um, I also understand that since that meeting, it was decided that Grant Street was getting some sidewalks and people knew about that, but people did not know about McKinley Street. And I followed the sidewalk plan, you know, very closely talking to my neighbors. I've read about it in the hub and I don't think anybody had any idea that this was taking place. And um, my understanding is also that it came down to a tie vote, a tie breaking vote, and it wasn't in a public forum. So I'm pretty stunned about that. Because after all that dialogue and after all these people who actually live here, who came out and spoke saying that we don't need nor do we want sidewalks, um, that I feel like the city's trying to pull a fast one and slide this in under the radar. And I'm very disappointed. Um, so I would really like you guys to consider losing those sidewalks on McKinley Street, Letter Historic Neighborhood, and it's a neighborhood that's dead-end streets. It doesn't go anywhere. Um, let it maintain that character. Let the people who live here decide what we want our neighborhood to look like. And um, I just think if this is, this feels like it was snuck in, and I think it's unacceptable, and I think you guys can be better than this. So that's all I have to say. All right. Well, thank you for taking the time to speak tonight. Yeah, I wish I, I wish I had known more. I wish I'd had more time. Yeah, and I well, it's possible think we could have had a lot more people here because. It's possible you'll hear more about it tonight. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right. May, uh, Mayor, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, this is why they hate to interrupt, but are we going to be discussing this in more detail tonight? Because I have thoughts on it as well. Oh, uh, we do some other council members, I think. Yeah. After we finish the public hearing, there is a, you know, a resolution on there as the next Thank item. You. So. Right. Thank you. All right. So that was the only person I had signed up for the public hearing, unless you had somebody else, Holly. I didn't see any others. I didn't see any others come through. Okay. So we'll close the public hearing and reopen for our regular business. And the next item for business is uh, R85, and that is the uh, resolution that came through the the finance committee. So for I just put up the wrong thing. Here it is. R85 uh, came from finance. All the person Schumacher. All right, R85 2020 resolution authorizing improvements and levying special assessments against benefited properties in the city of Stoughton for the improvement of curb and gutter, sidewalks, driveway aprons, carriage walks, retaining walls, sanitary sewer, storm, storm sewer, and water system improvements for 2020 projects. And I so move. Okay. And is there a second by Alderperson Reeves. Alderperson Schumacher. All right. Um, you know, a lot of this stuff we've we've talked about quite a bit here. Um, but uh, by going by what uh, from the public hearing that some things may be not known about quite as well. Um, I think it would just be best to really open this up for the discussions 
based on the, the items that are in, contained in the resolution at this stage. Okay. Thank Mayor, you. Can we, Mayor, can we have uh, Rodney kind of go over what has changed and if McKinley has changed over the course of the time, just so we are on the same page? Sure, and I think Rodney has been in conversation with many of the property owners. So certainly some of the questions that some of the neighbors may have, he may be able to answer during his uh, presentation. Um, do you want to walk through this? Do you want me to make you the presenter, Rodney? What would you like to do here? I can become the presenter, but first of all, I'll just speak to what you have on the screen, Mayor. Um, thank okay. you. Um, there were three things, you'll recall, we took bids or had bids for uh, the pulverization project that were awarded at the last council meeting. There were two changes to the resolution that would be necessary because we didn't know we did not accept the alternative bid for that project. So the portion of Roby Road from Johnson Street to Van Buren Street will not be included as part of the, as part of the special assessment. So that would be deleted from this. The other one was Harrison Court was removed from the project scope as well. I discussed those with the finance committee at the last meeting. And then the last change that I that I announced to the finance committee was that Grant Street in the north block between McKinley and Taft was narrowed by four feet on the western edge. Um, spoke with both both of the adjacent owners and um, came to came to understand that there was a desire to have that narrowed by a slight amount. Uh, we narrowed it by four feet. We pushed the sidewalk out closer to the curb and gutter. And it allowed us to actually move around the 30 inch tree to the north um, on the street side as opposed to onto the private property side. So those are the three project scope changes that I wanted to highlight. I would like to respond to, to the concern that was raised about the um, addition of sidewalks on the north side of Prospect Street. And I think it's important to, to maybe if you could share the screen, Mayor, or allow me to to uh, highlight something I think I can share. Yep. It's all yours and while you're booting that up. So it looks like what we'll have to do is when we're at a point uh, for consideration, it looks like we'll need to amend uh, this resolution here for the three items that uh, Director Shield just discussed. So we can do that when we get a little further in this process. Uh, go ahead, Rodney. Thank you, Mayor. Actually, only the first two would need to be amended in the resolution, the width of the Grant Street. It is just a notation of the change in the plans, but it doesn't change the assessment schedule. Um, so one of the things that was raised was how were sidewalks removed from the project? Um, people might recall that we spent some time with the different committees, public works and also council, talking about sidewalks and what was gonna be excluded. This illustration was actually part of the resolution, resolution 17 of this year, that depicts the areas that identified where sidewalks were going to be deleted from the project by waiving the, the rules of the policy. Sherman Street, shown on the left side of the screen here, was um, uh, acknowledged as not having any sidewalks. Grant Street, as shown here in the center of the page, was acknowledged to only have sidewalks on the western um, side of the street. And then on this graphic, or this page, it shows from Grant Street to McKinley Street, there was no sidewalks in that northern that northern block. That continues, all three of those continue to be the case. The inclusion that was highlighted by um, the speaker during the public hearing speaks to this property right here. This property is right at the, the intersection, if you will, of Prospect and McKinley. It was not part of the exclusion uh, discussion specifically. Um, and I'll actually show you on the on the plan set, how that how that actually looks. So we we did discuss the modified intersection at McKinley Street. So McKinley Street is along the top of the page and will intersect in the Prospect Street. The sidewalk section shown in yellow is the piece of sidewalk that's being installed to create the continuous accessible route. This cul-de-sac has sidewalks going all the way around it that terminate approximately at this point where the yellow starts. The sidewalk would be then continued to this intersection to have this um, accessible ramp crossing at an intersection. 
So that that's really, in my opinion, not a change or an add because a deviation from policy did not exclude sidewalks from this this part of the project. So um, I think I'm comfortable in 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 what I've presented along the way and been very consistent on that. So if if there's a confusion about it, I apologize, but I certainly don't think that this specific segment of sidewalks was ever not intended to be installed. And if it was, that's my mistake. As recall, the entire cul-de-sac has sidewalks all the way around. And in this case, if we didn't install them, they terminate mid-block at this point, instead of having a route for an accessible crossing at a controlled intersection. The other change I was going to highlight was the revised Grant Street. Uh, again, this is not a change in the assessment schedule, but it is a change to the plans that's in, that are in the engineering documents you've, you've been provided. This is the northern block of Grant Street. The curb and gutter was shifted to the east um, by four feet. So it narrowed the width of the street by four feet. We'll still allow parking on the western or on the eastern side or the western side. Um, but then it shifts to the sidewalk and you'll see the 30 inch tree now will then go around the tree on the street side as opposed to on the back side of it onto the property side. So that modification um, was, was incorporated into the plans that we're moving forward with right now. I'm available for questions if there's other, if there's questions. Uh, the other thing I would add is there was a little bit of uh, confusion about what transpired at the meetings. So what I did is I looked up the minutes um, at a council person's request and I consolidated. So there was two separate meetings where there were different actions, which I have on the screen right now. So these were at public meetings. The first one, as you might recall, um, we had authorized doing the road work without any sidewalks on Grant Street. And then we came back because there was a, a reconsideration to do the sidewalks on Grant Street. And that's where the tie vote occurred, uh, and whether or not we should reconsider that. And that was at a council meeting. And unfortunately, I had to vote on that one, but we voted to allow a discussion for reconsideration. And after all that, there was a vote to uh, to add the Grant Street, the one side back on, uh, which affected three property owners. So that was really a question that came up earlier tonight from the speaker as far as you know how that discussion occurred. And that was at a public city council meeting. Um, and there was a, you know, a vote taken and you know we, we designed and engineered it based on that vote. And then as you can see, some additional work was done on Grant Street in order to narrow the road. Um, and it seems like the property owners are okay with that. So we've been trying to accommodate the concerns and it's really part of what we've heard this week was there's a little bit of confusion as far as that one property on McKinley, uh, whether or not that was always meant to have a sidewalk and you can see that it was. There wasn't much discussion about that particular property as I can recall at Public Works or at the council when we were talking about reconfiguring the road there. Um, but I think you can see why it was engineered to have a crosswalk there with the reconfiguration. It would make sense to do that. So uh, having said that, um, I'll certainly you know open up the floor if any council members want to speak to the motion on the floor. I'll speak if I might, Mayor. This is right. Riley. Okay, a couple of things. One, let me say this. There were two votes, actually, where we defunded sidewalks, not just one vote. And then the reconsideration, there were two votes where we defeated funding for the sidewalks, at least as I understood what sidewalks there were to be. They were revised, a Grant Street was added, uh, that was defeated, and then on a reconsideration uh, from Mr. Caravello, it then finally passed. So Grant Street's done. And let me say this too, uh, to preface. Rodney, thank you, and I wanna thank the committee, and I wanna thank Rodney for adjusting the Grand Street project to bump it out four feet. I really appreciate that. It certainly makes it, you know, at least more palatable than it otherwise was. So thank you for that work. One of the things I think that is going on here, again, is, is, is that we think we're transparent, but we're not. Somehow or another, how we are doing things, and I don't think it's purposeful necessarily, but we're not transparent. Honestly, I 
I had no idea, and again, it was two separate plans, I guess. I thought what we were dealing with, guys, when we dealt with defunding the sidewalks and the SIP, because I wasn't allowed to address it, the policy to the committee, was this, just this neighborhood, and that's part of the neighborhood. So I missed something. Um, again, I don't, I'm not saying that somebody's being purposely deceitful or anything like that, but it's a situation where somehow or another, when I'm involved in this to the degree I am, when other council members are involved in this to the degree that they are, and we have no earthly idea that suddenly we're putting like a 10 foot or something, I don't know, it sounds like kind of a large project, on a cul-de-sac where there's no traffic, a crosswalk in a neighborhood on a cul-de-sac where there is no traffic, and we didn't even know it. Um, <laughs> Uh, it's just, it's, it befuddles me. I just don't understand how the heck that happens. And honestly, the project, you know, it, it seems silly. It is a waste of money. It, it is a waste of time. It is, again, uh, this is my personal opinion. I know I'm not a city planner, but my God, there's, there's no traffic there. There's the pedestrian traffic, actually, as I said, when I've argued against this in the past, enjoys this neighborhood for its nature, for its unique characteristics. There's no need for what we're putting there, and I suspect that it's going there, and then all of a sudden it's going to be, let's put sidewalks all the way up to Page, and McKinley all the way up to Page. Let's put a sidewalk there, because after all, we extended the cul-de-sac. The, the cul-de-sac, I think, was fairly new buildings, and I think that's the reason that there were sidewalks there. I don't know if someone else could speak to that better than I could, but that's my thought as to why they're there. But there's no point to this. It does not make any earthly sense to me at all. And then also, we, you know, uh, President Hirsch, I think we need to discuss how the hell it is that we get this information out to people. Because, you know, I, was, I, I thought I was pretty on top of this. I missed that. Uh, I spoke to Council Person Borisma. He feels that this was, you know, not that you know, people didn't know about it. The people in this neighborhood clearly didn't know about it. So, again, nobody's doing anything purposely here. I know that. But, boy, it's, it's not good. Um, I have comments, of course, about the assessment on grant, but I'll save those, I think, because should I save that for the next uh, resolution, Mayor, because that's where we're voting on the assessments themselves? I believe, that's, I believe that's where we're at now. How about if we go around and come back to you in case Thank somebody you. else wants to speak to Thanks. this? I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions or comments on, on this part? Uh, I would just like to reiterate that if Elder Person Riley, I mean, he's very passionate about this, and this is exactly what I'm looking for for other people to work on in the coming year. So if you could write that up and we could try to get it to the appropriate um, committee to work on in the, the coming year. So we have more transparency and we can fix whatever is, you know, is a perceived problem right now or is a problem. So let's uh, revisit it and let's look at it. And so we have the right policies in place. So people don't feel like we're not transparent. So thank you for bringing that up. Thank you. May I just say one quick thing, Mayor, and I know you're going to come back to me, but I just thought I would note, uh, uh, President, that I have uh, proposed a revision to the sidewalk policy with respect to these types of situations when we're retrofitting or building in older neighborhoods. I have, I believe that Councilperson Boris at least kind of made the Public uh, Works Committee aware of it. So that I have now drafted it there. I'll be happy to try and figure out something with respect to how the heck we get public notice out on some of these other things. Thank you. That's that's it. Just wanted to mention that. Okay. Anybody else have any thoughts about that? Okay, here and none. Uh, was there anything else uh, that you want to add, all the person Riley, in regards to the uh, special assessment? Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, again, I'll, I'll revisit briefly the, the tortured history of this, and that is, is, of course, as all of you well know, except for um, Fred, um, because he wasn't there. Um, you know, obviously, my neighborhood and I opposed sidewalks in this neighborhood. 
vehemently because there was no justification for them given pedestrian traffic, vehicular traffic, on an, econo on an economic basis. It was foolish. It was a waste of money. It is detrimental to the environment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So my neighborhood showed up and vociferously opposed this by a vast majority. And after three votes, the council decided to, uh, to pass it uh, on Grant Street. And again, thank you, Rodney and the committee for adjusting that. I mean that sincerely. Uh, having said that, what I heard constantly during the debate on this sidewalk issue in this particular neighborhood was, it's a community matter. It's a community matter. It's good for the city. We want the city to be walkable. City, city, community, community, community. Uh, that's fine. But there's no real benefit to my property as far as I'm concerned, none at all. There is a benefit from the street. There is a benefit from the curb and gutter. There is a benefit from the storm uh, and storm sewers, et cetera. That is all beneficial to my property, and I'll certainly pay my fair share in that. I, I object to being uh, asked to pay for a sidewalk that is there apparently from all the arguments I heard during our council meetings for the benefit of the city. It is not an ipso facto benefit to my property because it is there. Its mere existence doesn't justify it as a benefit. And if it's not a benefit to the adjoining property owner and only a benefit really or a benefit for the community at large, you know, that adjacent property owner shouldn't be footing the bill for it um, or part of the bill for it, I should say. So uh, I object to that assessment for that reason and that reason only. It's really a pro forma objection because I don't expect it to really go anywhere, but I really needed to say it. Um, this does not benefit this property. If it's a benefit to the city, as, as argued regularly during our debates, well, then that's fine, but it shouldn't be assessed against the individual property owners that are that are uh, going to have the sidewalk. So there you go, that's it. Mayor, Mayor, this is Sid Borsma. Sure, go ahead, Sid. Uh, so uh, I have uh, been working on this over the last number of days because I really did not know about this. Uh, and I'm on public works and somehow that was missed by me. And I apologize for that to all the neighbors uh, about that. I, I have no idea how I missed it. Uh, however, we have had a number of discussions about the fact that uh, with, the, with the number of people that came to the, the meeting is that they did not want sidewalks on uh, our, in our neighborhood. And, um, finally, the, the, there was a very close vote for uh, including Grant Street, but the understanding, there was no understanding that there was going to be a sidewalk. Uh, I don't think anybody in the neighborhood, with the exception of maybe one, uh, which, which is the, are the, are the people who's uh, going to have to pay a significant amount of money for a sidewalk that basically goes to nowhere. It's just going to be a crosswalk, up to a crosswalk. Um, I, this is not small potatoes, and um, I, I did talk to the property owner. Um, their assessment is going to be $4,469.79 for sidewalk work, gutter, uh, carriage walk, concrete apron, miscellaneous items, uh, which is outrageous because it is not needed. Uh, it is, uh, I understand that it may be. Uh, uh, I, something that is going to be have to be attached to uh, going up McKinley, which is going to again be, uh, I think, opposed by the neighbors. Um, I think that that may be an intention to have that sidewalk connect, uh, but but it's really not connecting to anything except a crosswalk through through a street that's being redone. Um, I, uh, I did talk to uh, the constituents and I, I think that they are opposed to it. I don't think that they know that they can do anything about it. I said that I, I told them this afternoon that I would try my hardest to try to get a, a good resolution of this. I looked at the minutes. The minutes are running clear from from a meeting that was held, I believe, in uh, let's see, I think it was in February, uh, and and it was uh, my understanding that most most people, including people in the neighborhood and people on council, understood that the sidewalk construction that was going to happen in our neighborhood was going to be on Grant Street and Grant Street only. Uh, so I object to this uh, strenuously that that, that uh, is going to happen. I think it's unnecessary, totally unnecessary. I'm with, I'm very much with uh, Alder Riley on this uh, and the neighbors, uh, as well as uh, 
um, as the constituents who are going to have to pay almost five thousand dollars for this project, which is going to be of no use whatsoever in our neighborhood. So that's that's my talk about it. I would I would like to uh, present that if this this is a situation and we can't resolve this, that I I'm going to do a motion to reconsider or do an amendment. Okay. Anybody else have any questions or comments? Earlier on in finance, we did talk about point four in there about the um, uh, the way that uh, can be paid in there, whether it's installments and and uh, the thresh the money thresholds in that. Um, those are in ongoing discussions in the finance committee now. Okay. Anybody else? I have, have a any? question. Sure. I have a question. It's a financial question directed to Brett. Um, is it possible to ever put a ceiling or a cap on the amount that someone could be assessed? That I'm not sure of because I, th I think our policies are, are clear on that in that it's usually as a where it's paid on a shared percent amount and without knowing what what amounts will be per construction. I, I don't I'm not sure about that. I mean I guess it's feasible. Rodney'd be able to, to tell you more about that one, I believe. Brett, actually I think yep. we did something like that a couple of years ago when um a retention wall with somebody in district three was gonna be like I think it was close to seventeen thousand dollars and we did cap it. And okay, so I think I know which that one is possible. Now. Okay. So that was the one on Jersey Street. Oops, sorry. I say that was that was a property on Jersey Street. Yep, I know that one. I talked to that neighbor. Yep. Mayor, might I make one more quick comment? Sure. You can hear me. Thank you. Yes. Um, you know, I, again, with respect to the transparency thing here on this, I looked at the public hearing notice meeting for tonight. And honestly, unless I am missing it and just running over it, I don't see where that little bizarre thing that we're now doing on the McKinley at the cul-de-sac is noted uh, in that notice. Now, I, again, I apologize if I'm missing it, I'm missing it, but I don't see it articulated as a definitive item anywhere. Um, again, that just speaks to this you know, concern I have that you know, people aren't aware of what it is that we're doing here. And if, and if it's there and I'm missing it, somebody correct me, okay? I didn't see it. Um, and, of course, the, the woman earlier tonight who was speaking about the quick trip, and I don't even know where the heck that's going in. I guess I better educate myself on that. But, um, you know, she had the same kind of concern that it's just we, we have to figure out a better way to reach out to people and let them know. And I, and I guess, uh, President Hirsch, uh, I'll be happy to try and work with you on that and other council persons for the time I remain on the council. Thanks, that's it. Sure, and I guess the short answer on that is, is when we deviate from the policy, we really only call out the items that are deviated. We don't necessarily highlight the items that we're doing as part of the policy on this particular project or any other project for that matter. Okay. So maybe okay. that's the opportunity there. You know, right. we, we tend to focus on what we're not going to do according to policy instead of what the policy mm -hmm. is and mm -hmm. you know we do you know as you can see in the resolution here um you know when you get down to you know item number five we you know we publish things in the hub we you mm -hmm. know try to get people on social media in this particular neighborhood i literally went door to door when we made the grant street changes so people could you know come to the hearings so we we had pretty good turnouts at the hearings of late as well. So I'm encouraged by that. And this virtual reality kind of throws a monkey wrench into things. So we're gonna have to really work harder in this area. So you know, I hear you. Um, you know, that's definitely an area of, of you know we can look at. Um so Mayor? Yes. For the purpose of uh, discussion on this uh proposal, I don't know if we have a has this proposal been seconded and, and introduced yet? Yeah, so we have a motion and a second, but we do have a need okay, so to 
to amend so I presented, it. I, I presented a, um, a motion to amend at least portion of it, which is to remove all construction on uh, the sidewalk we've discussed on McKinley Street. Uh, that, so that is my motion. Well, so this is kind of where we have to figure this out because we're really what we're doing here, we've already approved the work. We've already bid it out and we're under contract. We're at a point I, now. I, no, that's not my understanding. No, I think it's, I think that's, it doesn't matter. We had said, we had said we did not want sidewalks on in that McKinley Street area or any other part of our neighborhood with the exception of Grant Street. And somehow it got into the construction plan and, and uh, I'm moving to uh, remove that portion of this from from the uh, from the proposal. Well, I have to call a point of order because the resolution is only for the special assessment. It's not for the construction. It's really a question of if we're going to make um, the residents that are affected by these things, you know, pay for the portion that under our ordinance they're required to. Okay, I mean, well then, then my motion is to remove uh, the uh, requirement that this particular property owner pay any assessment charges for what is being proposed on McKinley Street. For, you're talking about the sidewalks or any, or what are you talking sidewalks. about? The, the sidewalks and any construction related to that sidewalk, yes. You know, basically what's happening is that we're, we're talking about curb and gutter, sidewalk replacement, carriage walk, concrete apron cost. We're, we're talking about a lot of costs, which which pushes this up to almost $5,000. And and I totally object to it. I don't think that given what has happened that the property owner should have to pay for that. If it's, if it's uh, the city, I don't like the city plan for it either, but I object totally to having an assessment of these neighbors who knew not, did not know that this was going to happen, and to the to our neighborhood that did not know that this was going to happen. So your motion is to amend the resolution to remove uh, the property owner. I believe it's 202 um, Prospect East Prospect. That's correct. Okay. Is there, is there a second? Second. Is Okay. Second by Alder Person Lagaki, was it? Yes. Okay. Um, we've heard from Alder Borsma and Alder Riley. Did you have anything you want to add, Alder uh, Lagaki? Um, nothing new. I, I think my thoughts haven't changed over time. I, I, I think that our process. I have some things to learn about the process, but the fact that so many have missed and that the will of the people at the public hearing wasn't heard still remains very troublesome to me. But I have since moved on as we've done these votes, and I'm hoping that uh, we find some proactive ways to do this better. Okay. Thank you for asking. Sure. Um, any other alders? So I want to just get a clear picture of what um, what communications have gone out there already. Um, I think we've gotten the communication out to the people who are directly affected by the assessments, correct? Yes. Okay. So it's it's neighbors of the people who are directly affected who might not have gotten that message, correct? No direct mailings, correct? That's absolutely correct. Okay. Can uh, I? I might. I. I have a comment on that, if I might, Mayor. This is Riley. Uh, keep it brief, so Ben has other questions I, and comments. It'll be very brief, and I'm sorry, Ben. I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, I spoke with these people. Their name is Holloway. I spoke with them this weekend, and I don't know how they missed it. But they said to me that this came as a big surprise. But now. Maybe I am misinterpreting that, that it came as a big surprise when they got notice of it, right? I don't know. Um, but they, they, they it had indicated that the fact that this project was going to occur came as a big surprise. I know Sid 
first became aware of it this week and he made me aware of it. So again, there's the transparency thing, but that that's all. I just wanted to make that comment. I'm done, Ben, sorry. Uh, I don't think I really have much more to add. I think it it's trying trying to rehash the sidewalks in specific is picking a scab at this point, but I, we, we should get the communications correct. And I, I, I think um, all of us thinking creatively about how to do that is, is important. I guess, you know, I, I, I feel for this landowner, but we have had many meetings on this. And um, I guess I, I just don't feel comfortable with waiving one landowner's um, assessment compared to all the other landowners that are listed on this uh, resolution. Um, equitably, I, I just, I don't feel comfortable just picking one landowner, say you get a free sidewalk and everybody else you have to pay for it. I, I just, if, if you want to do something across the board that everybody gets a discount, that's one thing, but to just give a freebie to one landowner, I'm not okay with. And when we had that uh, assessment a couple of years ago, we kept it for anybody that had a retention wall, I guess, over, can't remember if it was 5,000 or whatever it was. And that affected not just one landowner, it was uh, two or three people involved that year. Mayor? Mayor? This is this is Boris Ma. I, I want to respond to Regina. You, you know, the, the, the issue is not the assessment primarily. The issue is whether or not there should be a sidewalk in that crazy place on on what is either McKinley or Prospect. Uh, right. That's that's really the issue. That's the issue for the for the residents of this uh, of this neighborhood. Uh, we had a we had clear uh, a clear uh, number of people great number of people from our neighborhood who came in and said we don't want any sidewalks in this neighborhood uh, it affects the uh, it affects the neighbors uh, it affects the, the, the whole nature of the neighborhood um, that's you know uh, in the point of order the only thing that I have possible for me it sounds like other than a reconsideration and I can't do a reconsideration it sounds like I tried that last time on, on Grand Street. Uh, the issue is not the assessment. The issue is the actual sidewalk. The only thing that I'm able to do tonight is to is to uh, modify the assessment to these property owners. That's all. It sounds like I'm limited to do at this point. I wish I could do much more. Uh, but uh, the issue is not the fairness of uh, putting in a sidewalk and charging people. The issue is whether there should be a sidewalk in that spot in the first place. And I think that when you're talking about that, Regina, you're kind of muddying the waters because I think the issue is the issue of the sidewalk and then not the assessment. I think everybody should pay their fair share. I agree with that. But the right. issue is there should be a sidewalk in the first place. And I Can think I that to say that it's not fair to other people for the assessment that that's muddying the water. Uh, respectfully, um, Alderperson Bozma, but the resolution at hand has is is regarding the, the assessment. Um, it was already voted on with respect to the sidewalk, I think in February. So unfortunately that resolution failed back in February in favor of what you're talking about. So right now we're just voting on whether or not the assessment is what we're doing. And so I understand where you're coming from, but that's not really what we're working on tonight. Uh, that was all already um, decided on in February. But it's but it was unclear to everybody. That's the point. The point is that people are surprised by this. Uh, the property owner is surprised by this. Uh, Alder Riley is uh, surprised by this. I'm surprised by this. Um, it it uh, it was in a it's, it's in a a diagram that is unclear to me. Uh, and that's that's the issue. It's unclear. Uh, when we talked about it, we have talked about it at length about the fact that our neighborhood was going to be a set, uh, was going to be affected by the sidewalk on Grant Street and no other place. 
and now we now we see something that comes up in a in a uh, in a document that that includes that and I wasn't aware of it Riley wasn't aware of it we missed it and I'm trying to re I'm trying to resolve the issue and I can't resolve it by by a motion to remove that sidewalk but I can try to resolve this issue by saying uh, the property owner should not have to pay this exorbitant fee for a sidewalk that absolutely makes no sense in our neighborhood. Aaron. Anybody else have any comments on the amendment? Just a quick comment, if I could, please, um, since I serve on public works. Um, is that, am I okay? Can you hear me? All right. So with all due respect to Sid, you and I both serve on public works. And I have seen these diagrams for these sidewalks for many, 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 many months. None of this has been a surprise to me. And there was many opportunity for you to ask questions during public works and comment. And so I'm a little weary that in the 11th hour we're having this discussion because as a member of public works, this is not news to any of us. Well, it certainly was missed. So it was missed by it was missed by both myself uh, and and uh, uh, certainly a, a number of people in the neighborhood. All right. Any other comments on the amendment? So the amendment basically is to uh, remove the special assessment for the property owner at two hundred two East Prospect Street. All in favor of the amendment, say aye. Aye. Those opposed? No. No. So I would say the no's have it. So it takes it back to the original. We have, Mayor, can I request a roll call on it, please? Certainly. If that's appropriate. Thank you. Yes, you can always request, request a roll call. So as soon as Holly's ready, we'll do it. Thank you. Forsma? Aye. Caramello. Aye. Luke. Aye. Hiley. No. Hirsch. No. Hunt. Alderperson Hunt. Aye. What was that? An aye. People know what they're voting on? Yes, we are voted to die on the amendment. Um, Jensen. Uh, no. Lagaki. Aye. Mayeski. No. Reeves. No. Riley. Aye. Schumacher. No. Six, six. That motion is, uh, let's see, one, two, three. That is a tie of six to six. So that motion fails. So it takes us back to the original motion. In the original motion, uh, we still need to amend it for the two items that Director Shield pointed out. Would somebody be willing to make the motion to amend those two items? I so move. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Second by Hiley. Um, any discussion on those two items? Just for clarification, Mayor, if you wouldn't mind, I could just point out what it is. It's to remove Harrison, Harrison Court from the assessment schedule and Roby Road from Johnson Street to Van Buren Street. All right, hearing no questions, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. No. Opposed. Two opposed, um, that motion carries. Um, item number eight is um, R86 of 2020. 
This one came out of uh, Stoughton Utilities. I believe all the person Jensen, are you the liaison for Stoughton Utilities? But Your Honor, uh, I, I apologize. Judge, I judge. <laughs> Mayor, um, the last vote, I apologize. I thought that vote was only with respect to Robbie's amendment. Was that the vote to pass the assessment? Oh, yeah, you're or? right. Yep, you're right. Thank you. So that takes us back. Yeah. We have to go back to the original motion as amended. So Thank you. any questions on the original motion as amended? Nice catch. Thank you. All right, no questions. So all in favor of the original motion as amended, say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. 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 Three no's I hear. Okay, that motion does pass. Um, so next was the uh, utilities audit. And I think uh, all the person, uh, Jensen, do you want to introduce that from Stoughton Utilities? Uh, I will do that. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, it's resolution 86 2020, authorizing and directing the proper city of, uh, officials to acknowledge the receipt of the Stoughton Utility 2019, says 18, I believe that should be 19, audit report and management letter. And I would so move. Second. Second. Second by so please, President Hirsch. Go ahead, Greg. Yeah, please note that correction it says 2018 should be 2019. I will fix that. And that was approved 7 0 by the Utilities Committee. All right. And it looks like Jamin has it teed up here. Um, you want to introduce our guest? Sure, we have uh, Jody Dobson. She's a partner with uh, Baker Tilly. She's a partner of the utilities engagement on the, the energy and utilities team with Baker Tilly, and she will go through the presentation and the required communications. Are you able to hear me now? Getting a lot of feedback, Jody. I don't know if you, it, you may have to maybe mute or log off one of your, your items. Jody. Oh. Okay. Okay. Um, That's better. So I guess if we move to the next screen here, what I want to first start with is the highlights for each of the utilities. And we start with the electric utility. Um, we have the rate of return for both the current year and the prior year. And we do see that the rate of return has dropped a little bit during the current year, but it's still positive. And if we look at the graph below, we can see that the revenues are outpacing the expenses. Um, if we move down below that just a little bit, we have the months of unrestricted cash on hand, where the goal here is to have a minimum three months of operations on hand. And we can see the electric department is consistently close to that five month mark over the last several years. Uh, the next benchmark that we look at is debt coverage. And we see that 
the utility is well above the required minimum debt coverage for 2019, being at 2.7 versus 1.3. And the last benchmark we've got here is looking at the amount of infrastructure finance through debt versus equity. And the 25% through debt is a very reasonable and common range to be in. So overall, the electric utility has relatively stable operations with good reserves and a um, reasonable debt position. The next page looks at the similar benchmarks for the water utility. Um, we can see the rate of return has improved a little from 2018 to 2019. And in the graph below that the revenues um, continue to outpace expenses and that margin increased a little bit there. The water utility has been able to build its cash reserves during the last year. So it's closed a little over six months worth of cash on hand and has um, debt coverage again, well above the 1.3 minimum requirement. And the water utility has about 20% of its infrastructure finance through debt at year end. So again, overall a, a stable and positive position. And finally, looking at the sewer operations, we don't look at a rate of return because it's not a regulated operation, but we can see that the revenues, um, the balance over the expenses is relatively consistent over the last five years. The sewer utility has drawn down its cash reserves a little bit in the last year for some projects, but still well above that three month minimum. And the debt coverage is two times versus the 1.1 times requirement. These are actually backwards on the slide. I did double check that. Um, so, and then the investment in capital assets, about 21% debt. So really a very consistent picture for across all three utilities. The other document that I wanted to touch on is our reporting insights, and I won't walk through all of this document. Um, but this is a bit of a new format for us this year, and yet it includes a lot of similar information. So one, the first item I wanted to touch on is on page five. Um, this is really where we talk about the objectives of the audit. And then the next page also talks about management's responsibilities. The key here is that all of the information in the financial statements comes from your team and your records. Our responsibility is to understand your processes in order to design our tests so that we can issue our audit opinion. And your financial statements received what we call a clean or an unmodified audit opinion. So that's the highest level of assurance that we can give. If we move ahead then, starting on page 10, we talk a little bit more about that audit approach, touching on some of the areas that we focus on in the audit. And on page 11, we discuss internal controls. And I'm very happy to report that we did not identify any material weaknesses during the audit this year. That's a very significant positive item. Reflects very positively on you and your management team. The next section touches on required communications. Um, a lot of this is a no news is good news section, so I won't go through these in too much detail. And then beyond that, we do provide some information about upcoming accounting standards and other issues that are of interest to organizations right now related to cybersecurity, um, succession planning, et cetera. You've also got a copy of the management representation letter. 
And on page 33, there's information on um, one set of what we refer to as a uncorrected or waived adjustment. This is just um, an item that management chose not to record and it did not have a material impact on the statement. So we disclose it to you um, consistent with prior year. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Any questions from any alders? It all looks good, thank you. Okay, um, other person, Jensen, did you make a motion on this one? I did. All right, was, did we get- I don't, recall, I don't recall hearing a second, but I did make the motion. I thought I seconded it. Okay. I wasn't sure. Okay, so we do have a motion on the floor. Um, and the motion really is to acknowledge the receipt of the audit. Um, yes, correct. Yes, I stand corrected on that. Yes. Okay. Are there any uh, questions or comments on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed, that carries. Thank you very much. And we're gonna go to item 14, which is another audit. We figured you're having so much fun, we'll do another one. <laughs> and uh, we have somebody on the line for that one as well, I believe. Yes, good yeah, evening. Have... Sorry, Jamin, go ahead. Well, after you, I was just going to introduce you. you introduce you. This is Carla Gogan. She's the the municipal uh, partner in charge of. Well, we're gonna we're gonna continue the good news tonight. I will though say a little commercial break that the skies are looking really dark to the south of where I'm sitting in my house right now. So, um, hopefully, we'll get through this without uh, losing losing electricity. But uh, again, thanks for your time tonight and allowing us the opportunity to present the results virtually. I'm going to focus on the governmental funds and specifically the general funds. So Jody covered the utilities. The utilities operations are primarily financed through user charges. Uh, the governmental activities, specifically the general fund, their activities are financed principally through tax revenue and intergovernmental revenues. And so we focus on the general fund because it is the main operating fund of the city. And fund balance is the uh, metric that we look at. Fund balance is your equity at the end of the year. And so you can see that total fund balance increased about $550,000 from 2018 to 2019. And I will talk about uh, the reasons behind that in just a moment. When you break down fund balance, you break it down into several different categories. Uh, the first that we're showing here is unassigned fund balance. And your unassigned fund balance went up by about $360,000. And unassigned fund balance are funds that do not have strings attached or you, you haven't um, specified these monies for any particular purpose. The assigned fund balance remains relatively consistent from 2018 to 2019. And that's primarily made up of the payment in lieu of tax uh, from the utilities. It's uh, revenue that is recorded or uh, revenue in 2018, but uh, revenue that you will in your 2020 budget. And then lastly, you have non-spendable fund balance, the last category. And that also went up by about $300,000. Non-spendable fund balance assets that the city has and it intends to collect on them but they're not readily liquid and this is primarily made up of loans that the general fund has made to three TIF districts to five six and eight if we move down the page to the summarized income statement in the middle column it just says final budget you can see that you essentially budgeted to break even for the year but you'll see by the variance column that you actually had a positive variance of about $514,000 in the general fund. And that's primarily related to revenues and other financing sources coming in over budget. Your expenditures were spot on. 
And the two biggest drivers on the revenue side was the first being investment income or interest income. That was over budget by about 141,000. And then TIF number three, TIF number three owed the general fund some monies that it had borrowed uh, years ago. And TIF number three had adequate revenues in order to pay that debt off or that obligation off in full over to the general fund, about $181,000. So we're gonna page, which is uh, looks at your fund balance in the general fund in accordance with your policy. And so I do commend you because you do have policies that allow you to uh, manage your operations. And you have a policy that says that your unassigned general fund balance should be within a range of 20 to 25% of the general fund annual budgeted expenditures. The caveat to that, and it is spelled out, um, I have two lines below that, is uh, if, if you were to do the math and if you were to look at the unassigned fund balance from the previous page, you'll see that this amount on this page is lower. And that is because that amount is reduced by the deficit for the Opera House, which is about $200,000. And it's also reduced by a deficit development authority $67,000. So even when you take those two amounts, deficits offset that with your unassigned fund balance in the general fund, you, are, you do exceed your policy. So you're at about 28%. And your goal is to be within that 20 to 25%. So if you're gonna be outside the range, it's certainly positive um, to be outside in a positive direction. Down below is a graphic where we take a look at your unrestricted general fund fund balance. So this is taking a look at it in a different way, uh, where we take a look at the unassigned fund balance, again, where there's no commitments to those monies, plus anything in assigned, because an assignment, you can make a different decision going forward. And we compare that to the general fund expenditures, and you're at about 56%. So a very healthy fund balance position in the general fund. Before we switch gears to the debt service position or the debt position of the city, are there any questions on the general fund or the positive results in the, um, in the general fund? Okay, hearing none, we'll move on to the next page. Um, so when we talk about financing activities, you know, in the governmental funds, they are financed primarily through tax levy, through shared revenues and other state aid. And then you finance projects, capital projects, many of them through borrowings. And so you, again, for uh, borrowings, you have a debt management policy. And two things I just want to point out. One is general obligation debt, which is what we're looking at here, is secured by the taxing authority of the city. And that's one of the reasons why you're able to borrow at such favorable interest rates is because of that security that the city provides uh, with respect to the debt issued. And state statute limits all governmental entities to borrow up to 5% of its equalized value. So the top line in the graph below, that's your limit. That's your 5% of equalized value. The city's policy is to not exceed 4% of your equalized value. And at the end of the year, you're just over 3%. So you're well within the policy that you've established for yourself. Um, if you look below then at the graph, you'll see that the green line or the bottom line, that's the amount of geo debt that you have outstanding in comparison to the debt capacity. And the debt capacity, that's a lot of that is outside of your control. That's gonna be driven much by the economy and any growth or contraction that would happen in the economy. And then the line below is your debt outstanding. And so Jamin, if you scroll down a little bit, you'll see that the debt outstanding by type, uh, the city has of the 38 million outstanding uh, 36 million is related to the city. Just over 9 million of that is related to TIF projects. So it is anticipated that the TIF increment collected will pay those projects off. And then a small amount related to the utility. And then our last metric tonight, if we move to the next page, this is taking a look at of your annual spend in all your governmental funds. So this is taking a look at all your TIF funds, your special revenue funds, general fund, and you compare the debt service that you 
that you incur principal and interest and compare that to non-capital expenditures, you're at about 25%. Again, we like to look at metrics as um, over a five year period. Uh, we don't include capital because capital can fluctuate greatly. And this is just taking a look at, uh, for those of you who've been on the council in the past, I, I typically describe this as, if you're looking at a mortgage payment or a rent payment, you know, how much of that um, is in relation to your, your monthly spend? Well, this is looking at it in relation to your annual spend. Um, so there's really no right or wrong answer here. Um, it's just a, a metric that takes a look at what you're spending on debt service. What is important, and I know Damon does, or Jamin does monitor this, is what the debt service means to your mill rate. You know, what does that do to your tax levy? And then if you move down on the page, um, it just shows you the principal and interest that you did pay for the last two years uh, compared to the non-capital expenditures. Any questions on the uh, debt service metrics um, before I'll just mention a few things in the reporting highlights? So the reporting highlights document, Jody uh, did a nice job explaining um, the various components of this. We do issue two separate letters, one that's geared more to the city and one geared to the utilities, but much of the content is consistent. I think the two things I just, I wanna point out to you is, um, one, we did issue an unmodified opinion on the city's financial statements. That's the highest level of assurance that you can receive on your financial statements. It's what you've received in the past. It's what you should expect to receive. And then we did not note any material weaknesses on the city's um, portion of the audit as well. So again, during the audit, we have a responsibility to gain an understanding of the control environment. Uh, we do walkthroughs of key transaction cycles, and we did not notice anything that would uh, raise to the level of a material weakness. And that includes uh, any adjustments that we did note to the financial records. Uh, none of those were significant or material as well. So very commendable. Uh, the city was very prepared uh, for the audit. And so we certainly appreciate that. And um, I don't have any further remarks regarding this particular document unless there are questions. Okay. All right. Uh, here, no questions. Um, thank you very much. And I'm thank you. A motion. This one came through finance earlier tonight. Mm -hmm. All the person Schumacher. So I'll make a motion to accept the uh, audit report prepared from Baker Tilly. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed, that carries. All right, thank you. And thank uh, you, the next, you have a good night. Thank you. And the next item is, uh, I wanna skip down a couple, I wanna go to item 11. Um, Patrick, hopefully he's ready. Um, Patrick has uh, been working on an Eagle Scout project, and uh, he has a quick presentation he wants to do. Um, this came through the Finance Committee. Um, so I guess I'd look for a motion if you want to start out, uh, Alderperson Schumacher. I'm going to defer this one off to uh, Alder Reeves as I'll abstain from this vote because I have affiliation with Troop 167. All right. Very All good. right. All the person Reeves. Uh, resolution 87 2020 authorizing Patrick, I believe it's Wozniak, to construct raised bed, garden beds at Lowell Park and the city to contribute $965 toward the project. And I so move. Second. Second by Caravello, I believe I heard first. Yep. All right. Patrick, are you with us? Are you unmuted? Yeah. Awesome. I have you, uh, your PowerPoint on the screen. Just tell me when you want me to advance. You can go out to the next. Okay. Here it is. The floor so, is yours. Um, I'm planning on building four garden beds. And two of them will be 
22 inches hall, tall with a bench on it. And two of them will be closer or at ADA standards or they're, yeah, they're at ADA standards for people in wheelchairs so that they can like go up to it without having to bend over. And I plan to install them on June 13th that I updated that and through fundraising I've raised 965 from friends and family and I'm asking the city to match that and any excess funds will be returned 50-50 to donors and the city and all the labor will be provided from my troop. You can go to the next. Uh, this is the proposed location. I have of it, the orange boxes on the um, graphic are where I plan to. And then there's a picture that I took and drew in four boxes. These are the, this is the plan for the shorter box that's 22 inches tall. You can go to the next. And then this is the plan for the box that is 28 inches tall. And then this, um, so the two, like the garden, like the garden plots that are there already are, I think, 15 feet by 20 feet. So I made the boxes to fit inside that uh area but off the end of the existing plots so this just shows how far apart each box will be and how far from the edge of the existing plots they'll be um this is my quote for uh, two boxes from stone lumber for how much the lumber will cost Then this is a layout of how much the total materials budget will be for, and this is budget other stuff such as food for me to provide to workers, garbage bags, and water. Then this is the total layout of how much the whole thing will cost and how as uh, a breakdown of funds. All right. Anything else you want to add, Patrick? Otherwise, uh, council members may have a few questions for you. No, that's all I have. Okay. All right. Are there any questions for Patrick? I would just like to commend Patrick. I think this is great. We've been talking about having um, ADA raised accessible gardens and raised bed gardens in that area for a number of years. So this is fantastic and I look forward to seeing them when they're done. Anybody else have any questions or comments? Patrick, is this your last requirement that you need for Eagle Merit? No, I still have a couple requirements for my cookie merit badge. Okay. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. All right, here are no questions. Uh, all in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Any opposed? <clears throat> None opposed. Congratulations, and we look forward to seeing your completed project. Tim, I still abstain from that vote. Okay. All right. Next item is item number nine, or number eight. No, number nine. The next two are first readings from Stoughton Utilities. And um, Older person Jensen, do you want to introduce these? I'd be glad to. Uh, this is uh, Ordinance 8 of 2020, 
adopt to adopt uh, modification to subsection 74-112 and 74-113 of the City of Stoughton Municipal uh, Code of Ordinances. And it was a recommendation to the Council 7-0 from Utilities and it's the first reading. Okay. Anything else you want to say about that? I think Jill um, is on the line as well. Yeah, yeah, Jill could probably speak to it better than I could. Thank you. And probably Jamin almost better than me, because this is definitely Jamin's hard work that's been put into this. Um, in the budget, there was actually 6% that we were looking for, knowing that we would need a uh, rate case this year. Um, Jamin went through all the numbers, and, and Jamin, if you want to add to this, I know you know all this much better than I do. Um, but in the end, we're at 4.74%, which is about $1.55 per month impact to our customers. This is the first time we're doing a rate case since 2015. Uh, for the sewer um, utility. Jamin, do you have anything that you would like to add? Well, no, you pretty much hit it on the head. You mentioned that we had we had originally forecasted a 6% uh, increase. That was actually planned to be effective for uh, January 1st, but once we ran through the final uh, financial results for 2019, we A, bought a little time, and B, um, we're, we're, we're able to reduce that down to about 4.78. Um, Again, the, the impact we generally look at is is on the residential user. Um, so we're looking at about a dollar fifty, a dollar fifty five per month on an average user. Any questions or comments from alders on this one? Yeah, this, just uh, to comment again, like I said, first reading and it'll be back for a second reading on the ninth. Okay, very good. Um, and then the next one is uh, ordinance 10 or ordinance ordinance 9 of 2020. Alder person Jensen, this is also a, a first reading. Thank you, Your Honor. It's uh, ordinance 9 2020 to create section 74 17 of the city of Stoughton code of ordinances relating to the replacement of lead water lines. It was a first reading and uh, it was a 7-0 recommendation from utilities. All right. Anything you want to add to this one, Jill? I know you have a presentation. You want to run through it or? Uh, if that would be, yeah, I think that'd be helpful if, uh, if we do have time tonight. Okay, I have it queued up here. Just let me know when to advance it. Excellent, thank you. Um, just want to take the time to, I know we actually had our exceedance and led back in August of last year. And we went through a variety of different things and kind of want to give the background really ultimately of why we're proceeding at this point in time with an ordinance. And as you go through the next slide here, the big issue is ultimately health effects. Particularly in children, uh, one to five or really zero to five, um, also expectant mothers, but it really impacts a variety of different things, heart, brain development, um, reproductive organs, kidneys, bones, but it's substantial the impact that it can have. And these are lifelong impacts. Uh, besides brain development, a lot of times on the heart side, uh, over the age of 50, there's some additional issues that tend to arise for people. So it's a significant health impact um, and actually a threat for the community. Next slide. The one neat thing that this slide I think really highlights is the reduction, you know, basically the regulations that ultimately have looked at reducing lead exposure within our environment. So I think the biggest one that really is noteworthy here was when we went to lead free gas. But there's a variety of different things or steps that have been taken from a regulation standpoint to they reduce the exposure potential for lead. You can see that, you know, as that graph shows dramatic impacts on the level of lead in, in the blood. Next slide. When we look at our system, the lead doesn't start, actually our raw water is very high quality. We do very little treatment of that raw water. Um, that is lead free. We put it through our distribution system and at that point it's still lead free. When it actually gets though to the customer, um, depending on the type of pipe that goes from the water main that typically lives in the street to that customer into their home, is where it has the potential, most likely potential anyway, of picking up lead. And that's really if that pipe is made of lead. 
Um, so as it goes through our whole system, it's really lead free until it gets to that customer. You can go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, but there's kind of a complication piece to this is that that lead service is partially owned by the utility and partially owned by that prop private property owner. So the water main, as you see there, owned by the utility, that part of the um, service is owned to including the shutoff, which is the curb stop, that is all owned by the utility. And from that point, it's actually the customer's responsibility and their ownership. The kind of little graphic on the left there really highlights some of the different places within the home that um, the water can come into contact with lead, but ultimately it's really that lead service, which is the most significant potential source. Next slide. And this is just a graphic again showing what we know today as far as how many homes um, within the community have lead services. We've got 4,843 services through the community. About 9%, 9.7% of those um, are public side, so the utility side is lead, and then almost 16% is that private side. The um, point there is that when we actually do a street construction project, we do like to find those areas where there's a lot of lead services. We replace our side. We provide information to the customer side to encourage them to replace theirs, um, but they typically replace it at a much reduced amount than we do. Last year, I think we replaced uh, 80 lead services, um, five ultimately on the customer side were replaced. Next slide, okay. So what's our present situation? I think that from when we talked, really we, I had a presentation that talked a lot about the things that we were facing at that point in time, um, about a year ago or so, uh, a little bit less, about 10 months. And at that point in time, we believed that we could sample ourselves back into compliance, which would mean in the end, we do more sampling, lead and copper rule, and we get enough samples back and we get ourselves back in a state of compliance. Um, a lead exceedance is really not a violation, but it says there's a multiple things that need to be done, more education to the community, a variety of different things there. Since that time, though, the EPA has come down and said, you know, the 15 parts per billion, which is that threshold that we now need to meet, it's not going to be, it's not enacted yet, but it's going to be 10 parts per billion. And that's significant to us based on our, our samples. Going forward, all of our sample sites also, which are approved by DNR, must have lead services. We actually have currently, or in the past when we were sampling, some of those sample sites were, were copper services that we were sampling. Future state too, as we move forward with that EPA rule that I made mention of uh, from going to 15 to 10, they're also mandating that when we replace, there's no way in which we can replace the utility side without the customer side being replaced. So without an ordinance or some way to actually mandate that that occurs when we would do these street projects, we basically need to leave the lead in the ground because we would have no ability to then have that private side replaced. Um, here. Um, so moving forward, all the sample sites would have to be led. Uh, the other thing is we're looking at, we had to take a look at uh, um, and basically do a study of our water quality and see if there's anything related to our water quality that may make uh, those lead pipes or that lead more, um, you know, ability to actually migrate into the water. We did a first phase of that. Um, the next phase of that requirement ultimately from DNR will be actually looking at a corrosion control where we'll have to do a pilot study taking a look at our water and chemical um, addition to the water to see if we can kind of sequester that lead um, into those pipes. That first study that I talked about with the pilot study that we would need to be doing um, is about an $80,000 study. From there, um, once we determine the amount of chemical that we would need, which is usually an ortho or polyphosphate blend, uh, it would be about $55,000 annually to actually um, then add that chemical to try to sequester that lead. The, the other kind of downside of that is that we also are mandated by DNR on the wastewater treatment plant of our phosphorus levels. So those are all poly or orthophosphates that we're injecting in the water, which then at the wastewater treatment plant, we would need to even work harder to get back out at an additional cost. Also, as we move forward and look to the future, once we cannot um, sample back into compliance, we actually will be mandated to replace 7%. So basically going forward, annually, we're required to replace 7% of our um, services, but then again by the EPA, we would have to make sure that both the private and public side are, are replaced. So next slide. So this is a graphic basically of, of kind of highlighting the top, but there's 30 samples or in some cases there was more than 30 samples. And as you look through these numbers, the bolded number basically is what we got the 90th percentile, or that's what we're reporting out 
on the samples that we took for our lead and copper rule. And if you look at those um, bolded numbers, two things to keep in mind. One, some of those samples that we had done, 30 or more, depending on the year and what the condition was, some of those were copper. So they would tend to have very low uh, lead readings. Um, now from going forward, they no longer can be any copper, they must all be lead. And you also look at those bolded numbers and only two of those, of those, that time period would actually be under 10. And pretty much know that, you know, take out now these copper ones, there's just looking forward, there's no way we'll ever meet that 10 parts per billion. Unfortunately, it's just the situation where we will have to do something moving forward um, because we'll never be able to sample ourselves back into compliance. And when talking with the DNR, and we've done a lot of that, um, they've ultimately said that initially they thought that we would not be mandated. They couldn't force us to actually treat the water. They've come back now and said, yes, absolutely. If we cannot meet that 10 parts per billion, we will be forced to treat the water um, because in the end of the day, lead is a health threat. And then, so we've got to be able to address that. Next slide. So what I want to do, this ordinance ultimately is a part um, of how we take a look at how do we eliminate this issue. Uh, for me, I don't think that long term, the big, the, you know, come from a big picture standpoint of how do we address this issue is we need to remove the lead. Um, we may be in a position of having to treat the water, but we also want to look at that, I think, as a short term solution with the long term goal, potentially short term goal, but of, of eliminating lead across the board. So we've been doing ongoing uh, educational things. The draft ordinance actually in front of you right now is a part of that. That ordinance was actually based on uh, Madison and Manitowoc's and Oregon's ordinance. We did work with the city attorney to actually put that ordinance together. There's a replacement port program that basically the ordinance allows for. Um, so it basically makes sure that both sides, public and private, are replaced. Um, we do have an opportunity, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this, um, of possibly a grant. In 2021, the DNR is opening up funds uh, potentially for grant funding on the private side. And we're also right now working on putting together an RFQ, which is a request for qualifications to do a pre-qualification list of plumbers for any of those property owners this year that are replacing that lead service. They work through with those pre-qualified plumbers and they have the ability or could be eligible for um, being reimbursed for any monies that they spend this year assuming we get grant funding next year. So next slide. So currently DNR is coming out with this new um, grant. Uh, they have said that it could be a two or three year grant, um, but there's really no guarantee of that. It could be a one year. They figure it's gonna be about $60 million and it's 100% first come first serve. Basically we've had to be eligible uh, through the PSC reports as we've been reporting out that we have lead services. In the past, there's been grant opportunities, but in those situations, the low to moderate um, income level has, has not made us eligible. This one has none of those requirements. Basically, as long as we have, which we have through our PSC reporting, um, we have shared that we have lead services, we are eligible. So basically, we apply. Um, it's an opportunity then with also the ordinances because this would help fund or this would fund the, public, the private side with the ordinance in place, then it would allow for 100% um, elimination on, on the services. Uh, without a grant, we looked at a 15 year plan. We look at 7% annually is what we're gonna be mandated by the DNR to replace for lead services. It's about 15 years. And we actually, um, a piece to highlight with this is we kind of walked through, if we've got this grant opportunity before us, we're looking at 736 or so services that would be replaced through that opportunity. Looking at it from the perspective of it's a one, you know, it could be a one year uh, opportunity first come, first serve. So how could we actually replace 100% of those services? So we have been talking with contractors and determining exactly what a bid package would look like, specs to put that together so that we could actually achieve that over one year. Next slide. So the big, I, I guess a number of takeaways is ultimately that um, the lead issue is a public nuisance, it's a public health threat. And the process of the ordinance allows actually for us to provide an order, abatement order, uh, to each of the property owners. They get a 30 days to be able to respond to that if they do not agree. Ultimately with that, then they apply to uh, the circuit court 
um, and then that really goes through a court process that ultimately the Dane County Circuit Court would determine whether or not it's truly um, a public nuisance or not. The grant allows then for 100% um, of the public, or excuse me, 100% of the private side to be funded, especially on how we're looking at doing it because we would be bidding in 2021, this is not true for 2020, but in 2021, we would be bidding all of the work. So both the public side and the private side. And with that bidding process, then assuming we're grant successful, and we receive those dollars, 100% of that private side would be paid for by the grant. Um, if we don't get the grant, there's a special assessment process. And basically it's uh, set up for at five years, it would be 0% interest. At 10 years, it would be prime. And at 20 years, it would be one over prime. Next slide. I think this is kind of telling, you know, as we, we talked through this and we initially thought, okay, well, we'll sample ourselves back in compliance and then recognize that's really not going to be possible. We started to look at, you know, what opportunities are out there. Um, and as DNR, you know, walked through and explained to us that we would be mandated ultimately to treat our water if we couldn't come up with another solution, they brought forward, you know, we've got this grant opportunity. And we've been working really hard, very closely with them over the last, well, um, for sure six months, um, you know, a little bit more, but really hard on this grant opportunity for about six months. And this is just a statement from, uh, um, so we've been working very closely with the chief of the water engineering section of DNR. And to me, this just says a very solid, you know what, you guys are doing all the right things to put this together and they're going to help us through and try to, you know, make it, see that we could be successful. There's no way to know going forward that we could actually, you know, receive this grant. But I think this is a pretty solid nod from DNR that we are, you know, at least positioning ourselves in a way in which we could be eligible. So going forward from here, um, we'll continue obviously our education piece, looking for the ordinance to actually be first reading today, um, second reading June 9th, and ultimately approval. Uh, we'll continue to move forward with the grant opportunities. And public education, we've actually already started uh, doing uh, social media public education on exactly you know, what we're looking at with this ordinance, uh, link to the proposed ordinance, um, but also starting to you know, get people engaged and understanding exactly what the public health threat is. Um, the safe drinking water funds, which is actually where these monies come from, um, that opens up June 30th. That's one concern I sort of have with the timing of this ordinance is originally DNR had stated that the uh, grant opportunity would be coming forward in October. They've now moved that to September. So I want us to be as positioned because it's first come first serve to be set up to be able to, as soon as they open that grant up that we can apply immediately. Um, so we want to make sure that that's in place. And then in fall, basically fall of 2020, once we know we've received that grant through spring of 21, we would be gearing up basically to bid out this project um, and get everything in alignment ultimately to um, be successful of replacing 100% of those lead services. Another neat piece to this is with doing the project the way we're laying it out, and obviously a number of things have to align to make that happen. But the other piece on the private or the public side is we've worked with DNR and also through the Safe Drinking Water Loan Program, there is a loan process. Unfortunately, there's a um, principal forgiveness section of that. And as we walked through that and looked at that as 2021, we weren't um, eligible for any principal forgiveness. But in 2022, they actually are redoing those rules as far as what they consider to be a principal forgiveness. And we would actually, if we have to do again a number of things, we could be eligible for 30% reduction on our loan. So looking to actually do the project in 2021, worked out with Jamin that there's the opportunity for some interim financing, and ultimately then would seek out that loan in 2022 to cover the utilities portion. And with that, the opportunity for a 30% principal forgiveness. So that's what I've got. I just wanted to share all that information. I know it's a lot. Um, but there's a number of things that have happened since we really, you know, kind of walked through where we're at on the lead side. If I could ask you, Jill, uh, do you feel that uh, we need to move on this tonight? If so, we could make a uh, motion to waive the rules. I think I, I, I appreciate that. Um, I think based on just that June 30th date, um, that would be the soonest that I would be concerned about that grant coming available. Um, they haven't given us any kind of indication that they are going to move it to that date. So I would be okay with this just being a first reading and moving it, you know, waiting for June 9th. But I think if there's support, I, 
I guess I'm open, um, but uh, from a perspective of them opening up the grant before June 9th, I don't anticipate that. But thank you. Thank you. Jill, when you get into the uh, the public presentation education portion of this plan, uh, would you consider giving this same presentation at, at like a school board meeting? Uh, you know, we had the the issue with the River Bluff campus with the lead in the water there, um, just so that they're also seeing and anyone that's watching their meetings would also be able to know that we're working very well on this. I would love to. Um, I think the more we can get the information out, because I want to encourage, you know, we know so much. And I, and I guess what I mean by that is we do a lot of, uh, one, I want to get the information out so that they know what we're doing. But secondly, there may be um, properties out there that have a lead service that we just don't know yet. We do a lot of our, uh, when we do meter change out, we actually do cross connection inspections so we identify what the material is of the service. But there's still homes within the community that we haven't actually done that uh, cross connection inspections. I think the more information we can get out there, we can find those and, and make sure that we do achieve 100% between one, assuming we're grant successful. So yes, I would love, I mean, any of those opportunities, absolutely. I would love to give this presentation um, to whoever would listen. Great. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to underline that if we do get this grant, it's, it would be far beyond the the thoughts we had about how we were going to fix the lead issues last year um, when we were talking about this. Um, and if we do get this grant, it's not by accident. It's not falling into our laps. It's because a lot of hard work has gone into this, as Jill has said, on the utility side. And I'll thank Jill and the utility for that. And uh, I'm strongly in favor of this. Thank you. Ditto, that's fantastic. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And, and I just have to say the team has really been working hard uh, to come up with a plan to try to position ourselves and those also to continue to get out there and find out where those lead services are. So um, I really have to underscore the water division, uh, wastewater division is assisting with that and Brian Hoops as well um, to make this happen. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. Um, It'll take us to our next item, which is R88 of 2020. And this one uh, came through the plan commission. The next two items did. And I know we had some feedback tonight. And uh, we'll uh, run it through uh, all the person Caravello, and then we can kind of explain, you know, what we're looking at tonight and kind of what the process would be for this project if it goes forward. Uh, Alderperson Caravello, would you like to introduce us? Sure. Uh, yeah, if you can bring it up there, that would help me. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is R88 of 2020, uh, approving a certified survey map to combine the properties at 1700 East Main Street, owned by Mark Rosenbaum, Stoughton, Wisconsin, and I so move. Is there a second? Second. Second by President Hirsch, Alderperson Caravello. So this is a certified survey map to combine the properties at the corner of 51 and N. Um, from two lots into one, also realigning as part of this there is a easement that splits those two lots this would also shift or realign the easement that goes through those two lots um and i think rodney is really going to be the man with details on this thing <laughs> in essence it's really preserving the easement between um, the two lots, uh, if it becomes one lot, it preserves the lot, uh, the access point from fifth, from County N over to lot two. Lot two is the building that houses Fastenal. The only access for that lot is across this access easement east to west from this point to County Trunk Highway N. Uh, the consolidation of the parcels creates one parcel of land that would accommodate uh, potentially the quick trip proposal that's being considered.
but does it have anything to do with yeah so there is basically realigning that easement to number two just a bit from where it currently has been existing um, actually it's very it's essentially the same location um it the former lot line you can see used to split um, this easement was on either side of the former lot line so it actually is being retained in its originally planned location as as identified currently okay so ronnie does that mean that the lot number two still will use that area to get out of their lot I'm, I'm, i need a little bit of clarification of what uh alder caravella was saying and what you're saying does uh, lot number two have access to n now or not lot number two is the location that i'm highlighting here with a stamp on it Lot number two does not have any direct access to 51. The only access into lot two or out of lot two is across this access easement to County Highway N. Um, they may have some inner, inner um, easements that come out as a result of the development of the, the Quick Trip site to accommodate a movement that gets them out to Cedarbrook as well. But right now their only prescribed easement is in and out of this access point onto County Highway N across this parcel. Is, is that normal to like um, create a CSM knowing that it blocks another landowner's ability to get to a major road? I mean, because how is it if, what if there isn't an agreement and we agree to this and now that um, landowner has no access to the road? So this there's an access agreement or an access easement already on this parcel of land. It just happens to be on two lots, lots three on the south side and lot four. The combination of these lots into one parcel does not remove that access easement across the parcel. But they're in that next part, they're building of the next resolution, they're building would eliminate that, right? Uh, their site plan accommodates a route through the through the facility, not through the building, but through the site. Um, like I said, they might be uh, contemplating some other agreement that allows them to have additional access out to Cedar Brook. So at this point, the plan commission has reviewed the uh, the CSM request and also the a conditional use permit, which is the next item, and they're still looking for modifications for the site plan. So, what can I ask a question, tonight? Mayor? Pardon me? Sorry. I was just curious if I might ask a question about the project. Sure, and we do have developers on the line too, so if you need them to answer, oh, okay. they are available. Okay, thank you. Hey, I appreciate that. Um, this is all to person Riley. One of the questions I have is, is what, forgive me for not being aware of this, but what is there at present? What occupies these lots at present, if anything? It's vacant. Vacant. All of it's vacant. Right. How does this relate to the current um, quick trip that's on that side of the city, if at all? It, it, this is Rodney. It's farther, this one would be farther to the east. They've reported that their plan is after this one is constructed to uh, remove the other facility and market the property. Okay, so they'd be removing that building though and market that property, Rodney? Yes, that's okay. Do you understand anyway? Yep. Yes. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. That answers those questions. Thank you. Sure. Is there anybody from uh, the developers that would like to uh, to add on to that or did we cover it? This is Troy, uh, Troy Malazzo, real estate manager of Quick Trip. Just a point of order on, on Rodney's comment. The existing Quick Trip that's been there uh, for about 30 years, we'd replace that with this facility. We'd remove the fueling operation and put the building up for sale. So we wouldn't necessarily tear down the building, but the fueling operations would be removed, removed when the new store opened. That's all. And if, if I 
can I ask a quick question? When you refer to removing fueling operations, does that involve removal of the tanks that are underground for all the gasoline storage and all that apparatus? Yes. This is um, Jean Lagaki with a question. I, um, I'm trying to understand the concept of ease of access versus access of traffic. Those are two different, two different uh, points, and I just kind of want um, a little bit more explanation about this lot two's access if they're combined. It means that the ease of access remains the same, correct? We've just combined these lots. Is my understanding correct? The route, yes, the route for traffic to get to lot two remains the same with this, this survey. So um, most of the concerns brought up by people tonight about this would be covered more under the conditional use permit, right, than this uh, survey map. And or the uh, site plan. Right. And the, the site plan, would, would we approve that later? The plan commission has approval authority on the site plan. Right. Okay. Thank you. Mayor, sure, Tom Matson. Say, I would just like to reiterate to make sure that the council members are aware that the existing easement that's there, uh, providing access to lot two remains unchanged. It's in the same okay. position that it has been. And just wanna make sure that that's clear. Nothing has changed with Thank regards you. to access to lot two. Thank you. I should actually clarify, yeah, when I mentioned that, I was looking at a note that I had here that actually was, I, I apologize if I created any confusion with my comment about realigning or shifting the easement. The easement will stay from, from and leading to law two. Mayor? Uh, go ahead, Sid. Yeah, um, I just wonder, I don't know if anybody knows, but um, what is the possibility that this is not an uh, environmental uh, clean site, the old, the old cook trip. A super fun. Are, are you suggesting the current site we're looking at is is related to an industrial or a a, a super fund? Well, a number of gas number of gas stations. In the past, in our city, and and also our, our uh, super funds, I just wonder. It's been there for a long time, so I I just wonder what the possibility is that it might be a super fund site. So I understand you must be re referencing their current location on the east side. Um, I I think the super fund sites are generally related to industrial waste and or um, our super fund site is a former municipal uh, solid waste site. Um, Generally, gas stations, I, I think, fall under a different type of cleanup uh, other than Superfund law. Um, but I, they'd certainly have to adhere to all cleanup requirements for that. Well, what, what, what about that marathon site? Was that Superfund or not? No. OK. Yeah, I think the understanding is Quick Trip would take all the necessary, you know, work that needs to be done to make sure that site would be clean so they can market it they're not going to be able to sell it if it's not clean so um you know it would be their responsibility to do that on this particular site you know they they need both lots in order to build the type of store that they believe will be able to serve this area i know we heard some concerns from the neighbors um and i think a lot of those concerns are more with with road and access and traffic. And I, I believe that there's been conversation with Dane County on some of them issues. I'm not really sure if they're resolved or what exactly the process would be to address some of them. 
um, you know, let's face it, something's going to be developed there someday, either on both lots or one or two lots. And, you know, there's an opportunity in front of us now to be able to serve the east side of town better. Um, it's certainly short of a, you know, a grocery store, but the newer quick trips certainly have a lot of more more products than, than the current store would have to offer um, the east side of town. So, you know, anytime, you know, you have a change like this, there's pros and cons. Um, and what we're trying to do is put together a plan at the planning commission that will address as many of the issues that we can, um, you know, to make this a positive experience for the neighborhood and all the customers that want to come in and out of the quick trip. So the first, step really, the first step, I think, for them is to acquire the land and, you know, oftentimes these offers are contingent on certain things and the CSM would have to be something that would be executed in order for them to potentially build on this site. So that's really the first step. Mayor? Sure. Riley, thank you. Um, I, I think we're, we're considering a conditional use permit. Why do we need a conditional use permit in this instance? I thought I saw a note perhaps from Director Shield that advised this has always been uh, zoned commercial. So I'm just curious why there is a CUP required. It, it is zoned commercial. Uh, it does it plan yeah. business. It does allow for um, a, a list of permitted uses and a list of conditional uses. Um, gotcha. In vehicle sales and service, such as this for the fueling and the car wash, for example, yeah. are yeah. under our zoning regulations, a conditional use permit within that zoning district. Thank you. So this resolution is only for combining those two lots into one at this point, and then we move on to the the conditional use permit. And if that's the case, I really don't have um, see any problem with the the CSM. And I'll see my comments for the con conditional use permit when we get to that point. Okay. Anybody else on the conditional or on the CSM? So we'd be voting on a certified survey map, the CSM. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries. So then R89 um, would also be coming out of the plan commission. Uh, Alder person Caravello, uh, I can try to pull that one up for you quick. And Thank then I'll you. send it back to Rodney after you make the motion. All right. And there this is our, uh, ready? Yep. Okay. This is R89 2020, approving a conditional use permit request by Quick Trip for an in vehicle sales and service use, including outdoor display incidental incidental to an indoor sales use at 1700 East Main Street, Stoughton, Wisconsin, and I so move. Is there a second on that one? Second. I didn't hear who was first. Second. Did you catch it? Holly? Hey, Hirsch. Okay. Sounds good to me. Who's on first? What's on second? It's yeah, all whoever is not muted. <laughs> all right. So Rodney has the screen back. So we'll talk about the conditional use permit. Um, is there anything you want to cover, Phil, or do you want Rodney to run through this? Um, I I think Rodney can run through it, and then we can get to questions and comments. Well, the condition of the use permit is just just that, as described, is to allow for the in-vehicle sales um, and um, in-vehicle sales for the car wash and the fueling station and the incidental outdoor display for their items. This is just a, a layout that's being proposed for consideration. And as the mayor indicated, uh, there's questions and some uh, continuing di dialogue related to the site plan with the plan commission at this point. 
Um, but what you, you can see is the access easement traverses the site um, and allows for access to the lot two off to the right-hand side of the screen here. Um, and it, it bisects the parcel there to accommodate that. The particular movement you see on the screen here shows how they would utilize uh, the site to get their fueling uh, vehicles to and from the site and be able to do that on site. Including your packet is all the materials from the plan commission. I don't know how much in depth you wanna go um, related to that, but it's really related to the, the use of the site. And if Robbie, I can- Go ahead. Uh, if I can, at this point, there's a, a, a lot of the concerns as you know, folks spoke about were um, really site plan considerations uh, and uh, just ingress, egress to this location, uh, the ease of use of the easement, really, since it becomes a right in, right out only um, with that uh, piece that I think Rodney at planning referred to that as a, as a pork chop, uh, that the thing that splits the easement where it intersects with N. Um, some other concerns that folks had were a potential nuisance situation with hours of operation of a, a something such as this uh, impact on the neighborhood. Um, so aside from pedestrian access, safety concerns, uh, traffic crossing, what is the easement, which still to me seems, you know, this, this, I might be going back into site plan and stuff again, but still seems extremely bizarre to me. And I don't think there really is an example of something like this that I'm aware of. I kind of sort of started thinking about the quick trip in McFarland on 51 and I forget what the name of that street is, but that's across from the state park. And I think everybody's passed numerous times, but that has a lot of different access points and does not have this easement piece dissecting it. So. Those are just a few of my comments at this point. Can I ask um, some questions at this point, Mayor, or should I wait? Okay, no, go ahead. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, curious as to how close the residences are to this proposed uh, new quick trip. Uh, you know, what what type type of proximity do we have to the uh, if it were to be built uh, to the lot and to the uh, improvements? So on your screen now is the zoning map of the area. Um, the, the parcels okay. in question are, are in the center of the screen at the intersection okay. of County and 51. The yellow are single family residential and uh, the, the darker color here is multifamily and the um, kind of tan colored ones are, uh, are actually duplexes or two twin homes. Can you, can you tell me, Rodney, since honestly, I'll be honest with everybody here, I can't see the damn screen. I do this on my phone and just look at the darn uh, packet on my computer. So let me ask this. Can you give me an idea from your knowledge about how close we're talking about with respect to these residences, et cetera? I, I'm, you know, the people that are on the one street, I can't remember what it was, Clarkson or whatever the heck it is, that were concerned about potential traffic, et cetera. I'm just curious what we have as far as the density and proximity of residential uh, units to this proposed quick trip. Uh, and, and I know it may, may not be fair, but just a general idea of what we're talking about there. Well, there is a single family home and a twin home across the street from the site. Other okay. than that, all the, all the homes are, are farther distance than that from, from the site. Okay. Um, and with respect to lighting, et cetera, you know, for, this, uh, for this improvement, are we, is there any concerns with respect to light pollution or whatever, or would that only be affecting those two homes across the street as far as the way the lights would be cast? Um, the lights have to meet the, the photometric requirements of our city ordinances, and they've yep. been submitted to do so. I have a foot candle at the property line. 
Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Mayor? Question? I'll go ahead, uh, all the person might ask you. Uh, I'm looking at the planting plan on this. I had calls from residents in this area uh, and they were requesting that, uh, you know, this is a pretty much of a cookie cutter uh, franchise layout. And, uh, and looking at their planting plan, it's incredibly weak in screening for towards the uh, residential site. Uh, they are aware, you know, those residents were aware that this was a commercial site and they fully accept that. However, they're asking for um, some consideration as to um, some buffering. And I totally agree with them. I mean, this is pretty sparse, pretty sad. Uh, I would like to see I would like to see a beefed up screening. I think that would help quite a bit as far as uh, or at night and during the day. And um, I think it would help minimize the impact on the neighborhood. So Tom, you're saying, okay, so the retention pond is closest to the residential area. So you're saying around the retention pond area to create um, more of a screening for the residents Correct. across Peterbrook? Correct. I mean, this is this is this is about as bare minimal as it gets. What you're looking at here. I had a question. Um, probably, f uh, maybe for um, Rodney. If we were to approve a conditional use permit, is it putting a car the cart before the horse given the number of site plan issues, traffic and pedestrian, or does that have to, does the conditional use have to come first before all these other really important details that seem pretty big have been worked out? So this might be a good time for Matt and I to, to remind the group about Act 67, about the conditional use statutes that changed. Um, I'm not to influence it, but if there's uh, reasons to um, uh, object to a conditional use application, there has to be um, substantial evidence to do so. I, I'm not disputing anything you're saying. I'm just suggesting that we have to be mindful of that um, requirement. Certainly the points that you're raising are certainly things that I know that the plan commission has been talking about with the, with them. Um, we're anticipating seeing the revised plans for the next plan commission meeting. Um, you know, certainly that right now they're, they're interested in seeing that their use can get confirmed for this site, um, for the in-vehicle sales and service. And that's what they're really seeking as a result of this request. I just have one question as well. Go ahead, Alder Boisman. Uh, um, is there going to be heavy truck traffic in this area, like diesel, and uh, and uh, semis or large trucks? And I think right now the east side doesn't have a whole lot of that, but um, I'm wondering if the expansion is going to include uh, more more noise and from from large vehicles. Maybe Troy can speak to what they're trying to service here. Sure, this is Troy Melez of Quick Trip Real Estate. Yeah, this wouldn't be what we call a diesel facility like we'd have somewhere um, on the interstate. Um, there'd be inline diesel for pickup trucks and that type of thing, but the site itself isn't designed as a uh, truck fueling center. That That's not what we're proposing here. What we're proposing would be a replacement facility kind of for the modern age of what's been in on the east side of Stoughton for the last 30 years in kind of a, a modern form and format. So short answer, no, we're not seeing this as a truck fueling facility. Thank you. So Rodney, on, on this site, and maybe the, the, the developer kind of alluded, still looks like the easement to lot two goes right through the center of this. Um, quick trip and I just really have a concern about public safety when you have like a 
almost like a road going through the center of a development like that goes between your pumps and your store to me i think you're setting it just to me i i really have a problem with that design that i think it's a, it could be a public safety issue if you have people coming from lot two running across this property to get to highway and i i i really would like to see that changed and have a, a different outlet for lot two that they can't just run across this as it's like creating a road in the middle of a, a gas station which i really have a problem with i'm actually if i can i'm i'm going to piggyback on uh, one of my problems with this is and this might again be site plan things but since regina brought it up is um truck access to lot two where the fasten all is in that mall through this easement and especially with the the thing referred to as the pork chop there i just don't the with the right in right out of a semi using that access just looks un undoable to me i i don't quite get how that's going to work so I, I i think that's pretty much impossible the, the way that this is set up um on on top of the fact that this then puts a whole lot of traffic onto cedar brook because anybody that's coming out of this lot that wants to go into town has to go out cedar brook and then turn left from Cedar Brook on to N, because they were not going to be using that that pork chop section right there. So that's going <clears throat> excuse me, that's going to increase the stress at the intersection of Cedar Brook and N. Much less, what is it? Is it uh, and also at, at Stony Ridge, which is the the street that exits that comes onto Cedar Brook right across the street from the north driveway of the quick trip so this is gonna there's gonna be major traffic impact i also want to add that um not living very far from this the there is a hill that drops off significantly as i believe one of our residents talked about there there are some sight line vision with turning left onto n I, I have some big concerns as well as I just want to add I, a lot of constituents contacted me as well and I bike through there a lot heading out of the town biking and um, may I ask um, at the planning committee meeting what was discussed around safety at that meeting and can anyone fill in why the state is not talking about any access to highway 51 I can speak to I, the state has refused access to Highway 51 on this platted area for many different applications, including the fast and all site when that was first um, being built. Uh, there was or being considered for construction. The DOT was adamant about restricting traffic onto. It's that was a sidebar. Rodney. Try again, Rodney. I'm sorry. Um, did, did that answer your question about, you know, I'm not the DOT, but I know that there's been numerous requests to have access onto 51 from this air, this platted area including even the daycare that's under construction on the other side of 51. You recall Casey right. was looking at site there. Uh, they refused access an access point to 51 as well. So um, it seems consistent with their practice to not allow access to 51. And and they're quoting as their uh, basis or, uh, I mean, what, what did they specifically say outside of we're not granting? I mean, is that all that you get from them? Because 
it seems logical. There is a stop. I, I think the stoplight's going to get really creative anyway. Um, concerns about turning left, concerns about lack of sidewalks, not to bring up sidewalks again, but lack <laughs> of them. There, there aren't sidewalks at that intersection. Um, and so with this new quick trip and people possibly having access to it, people, pedestrians, as well as cars, I, I have some major concerns, but I'm wondering why the state is, is, is not at least giving us reasons why. I think or part did of they it is the distance between the lights and the driveway, because if vehicles get backed up, they can get back up to the point where you can't even get in and out of the driveways. I th think that was part of the conversations that I've heard in the past, that it's just the distance between access and the light, especially when Casey's wanted it on 51. That was one of the issues. And I assume that it might be similar on N, although N is more, it's a county road, it's not a state highway. And I, I don't know if the rules are the same or not. Um, I don't really have a lot of insight on that. I can tell you the, the plan commission did express some concerns about uh, some of the things that Phil described as far as traffic flow, um, the point that um, Regina made about people literally walking across a basically a road, even though it's an easement or a driveway to get from the gas mm -hmm. pump to the building. I know that's mm -hmm. a concern that I still have. Um, and we're hoping that they'll come back with a reconfiguration plan that does address some of the pedestrian safety as well as some of the uh, vehicular safety concerns that have been brought to our attention. Uh, what that said, I guess I, in good conscience, cannot approve this tonight until I see something that addresses a lot more of those concerns. I just, mm -hmm. I, I, the public safety, like I've always said, is paramount. And to have an easement or a road cutting where people are going to be trying to pay from the pump or going to the to use a restroom or buy something is it's just it's unsettling it it's to me and and not having the issue with the the site with the hill i i guess i i'm going to vote no on this until those changes are made i think what we should try to do with this conditional use permit and matt you can certainly jump in as it's it, we're in a strange position with the state law to just say no. I think we have to look for things that we would want to make part of the condition. Is that how you would put it, Matt? Um, well, we, we definitely are in a much more complicated place given given how the, the laws change regarding conditional use permits. Um, it seems one of the thing. It seems to me that the concerns I'm hearing relate primarily to traffic issues both ingress and egress to and from the site and then traffic circulation within the site um honestly i'm not certain whether or not i'm, I'm not confident that that i know whether it would be appropriate to say look those can be addressed or should be addressed as part of the conditional use permit process or those should simply be site plan issues I, i'm not sure what the answer is but rather than voting <coughs> you know, yes or no, if if the council believes that it needs more information, more evidence uh, relating to these concerns, then I think that's a better decision to say, let's um, either remand this to the plan commission for further fact development regarding these traffic issues or table it and get the information presented at the council level. Um, you know, under Act 67, some of the basic nuts and bolts are this This is, on the conditional use permit at least, I call it something akin to a quasi-judicial determination where whatever decision is made has to be based on evidence and related to the standards in the ordinance. And, you know, I, one of the things I, I asked Rodney during the chat, you know, has a traffic impact analysis been done? 
uh, apparently we, that, that hasn't been done yet. I'm not sure if that would get you the information you need to figure this out, but it sounds like I would go in the direction of saying, where do you feel that you need more information and, and try and get that information rather than voting no? All right, I will take that advice and I'd like to uh, send this back to planning to get better traffic information and a possible solution with respect to the road going in through, cutting through the middle of, of the proposed plan and a number of the other issues that the constituents have outlined in our email that was sent to us earlier today. Okay, so how I, I can also, we I also would like to add, just add uh, in that same in that same flavor, um, that I, I think these are some unique times. Perhaps neighborhoods weren't fully aware, um, though I, I I see some comments and some people attending these meetings as I've read through these notes very carefully. But I I want to put out there that that three hundred feet clearly we've heard from people who are a lot farther than 300, 300 feet away from this development. And as I look at these potential pros, proposed tra um, traffic patterns, I see people turning right onto Cedar Brook and then that next street where all of those duplexes are and then finding there. I see lots of people impacted. I, uh, not that, this is nowhere near the scope of Kell Park West, but when we at least try to listen and get people together to understand each other and, and talk about the issue and just try to understand it as it's in the works, I guess I'd like to add that maybe Quick Trip and or us as a body uh, perhaps try to help arrange something like that right now because I think we've had a lot of constituents weighing in and I think more understanding is needed. So how do we word that into a motion? I heard a some things. Was from, the table. So we're going to table something. It, and then we should either set a date or give the, well, we can't really tell the plan commission what to do, but we can certainly make some suggestions. And obviously uh, we have some alders that are on the plan commission that are, are you know, hearing this. So, you know, I, I think if you could at least give them some direction, I, if they don't have enough already, Phil or Tom, um, you know, do you feel like you have enough direction, Ozzy? I do. Yeah, I think we're, we're doing good, especially Gene's point of giving notice to people, especially one point that I didn't, analyze enough until just recently, like over the last bunch of days, was that Stony Brook uh, for Meadow Drive, Eastwood Drive, uh, and Stony Ridge, like Stony Ridge is the only way out of that neighborhood for those folks. And if that, the, the access to the quick trip the only way in and out of the quick trip, if you're going north back into town, is that Stony Brook right there. That's just, I just can't see how it's not just going to be a mess. So, mm -hmm. it, it, yeah, if we can notice all those people on Stony Ridge, Eastwood, and Meadow, I think that would be us. This is, can, this is Matt. Can I weigh in for a second? Sure. Yeah. So when it goes back to the plan commission, if it does, if, 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 the, if the council sends us back to the plan commission to evaluate the traffic issues, the point I would make, and, and I did make a presentation to the plan commission on kind of the new world we're in on conditional use permits. Um, so, I mean, I think it's important to get some actual evidence that addresses this. So from a traffic and engineering standpoint, is that a workable, um, arrangement or not i mean would people have the ability to get in and out of stony ridge in a in a reasonable and an appropriate and safe way 
uh, without access to the Quick Trip or not, based on you know an, an actual uh, analysis by a qualified professional um, who can provide evidence that we can rely on. One of the things that Act 67 says is explicitly that it's not allowable to base decisions on speculative comments by anyone. So just the fact that somebody thinks something is not enough without some more to support that conclusion. And so I guess we'll have to, you'll have to plan, you'll have to have, there'll have to be some discussion about how to get there, how to develop the factual information needed to know whether um, there's an issue or not. Sounds like so, we need a traffic study. Yeah, it does sound like well, I think we need to address the traffic, the pedestrian safety. Um, you mentioned screening. I don't know if there's any standards for that, but certainly we could see if there's anything out there for this type of building. Um, and then was there anything else? Because we have to get this in the that, motion. Mayor, I think that uh, I think that we need we need to take heart on the fact that constituents in the, in the neighborhood should have input uh, as many public meetings uh, maybe presentations by quick trip as we can get uh, because i don't want i don't want anybody to be surprised on this like we did mm -hmm. earlier tonight the other thing that i was going to mention we talked a little bit about pedestrian traffic but I know that they, we have a lot of people in um, that are utilizing the current quick trip that walk, um, don't have cars. There's a lot of a fair amount of low income housing. And so there will be people wanting to walk. And so I'm just trying to figure out how they're going to cross 51. Um, so when we're talking about traffic, I want to talk not only about in, in the complex, but getting to and from because people are going to walk over there. And and Lisa, we we bike along there and frequently see people walking by that um, billboard where there's just a, a path in the field. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lack of a lot of sidewalks. I, I, I really didn't mean that in jest, but it did have a histrionic nature to it when I said it because um, there are very few sidewalks and here we're developing um, as well as the concerns of the traffic. I agree. Okay, so I think I heard uh, Council President Hirsch making a motion to postpone this and to ask the plan commission to take a look at these issues. Correct. The, the traffic study, the walkability, the public safety, the, with respect to the access that goes right through, um, the constituents not having a, ample access to input, and lastly was the green ability of the site on um, Cedarbrook by the retention pond. Is there a way to screen? Um, it off so the people that live across Cedar Brook are not inundated with, you know, now this uh, gas station. A second. If it hasn't been seconded, I will second. Uh, I think all the person Reeves seconded it. Hey, did you get something or can you and Matt work on something? I got it. Okay. Does everybody understand what we're trying to do here? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So, I, I, I did. I, I did. Uh, I did add that I think we should have a public hearing on this public meeting. Yeah, I, think that I put that in as constituent input. So, hopefully, that Mayor, covers it. Uh, but, but I'm thinking that planning could have its own public meeting on it. Mayor, I think we already had one. We had two, Mayor. Two. And, you know, okay. I just sort of interrupt, but, you know, a couple of those neighbors has actually gone door to door to all 57 neighbors down there. So, I, you know, the lack of the lack of notice to the residents, I'm sure that, uh, you know, they've been gone physically door to door, as uh, Mrs. Clark uh, indicated. 
And we did uh, wind up doing two, not one, but two public hearings on this, uh, both February and uh, uh, the first part of May. So, so yeah, sure we're all aware this is Alder Rod Sorry. I'm just wondering who's speaking. I'm sorry, I'm not certain who's speaking oh, right that now. Was, that was uh, Tom Matson. He's a, a realtor. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I apologize. I just didn't know who it was who was speaking. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, go ahead, uh, Alder Majewski. Um, look, what we're looking for here is some empirical evidence as to to grant or not to grant a uh, a CSM to this property. I see. Uh, that can't be done until we have further evidence and has by state law has nothing to do, uh, unfortunately, with what the residents in the area want. It has more to do with uh, solid data that shows reasons for denying or accepting the CSM. It's plain and simple. Yeah, that, can't be done we, that cannot permit. be done until we go Closer through the plan commission. Conditional use permit, not the CSM, but just Excuse me. yeah, conditional, whatever. Um, so I'm calling the question. Okay. So uh, yeah, I think it sounds like the plan commission members have enough information. So uh, we'll take a vote to postpone, send this back to plan. Um, all in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed. That carries. All right. Jamin promised these next two would go really quickly. Um, we're on number 15, I believe, R90 of 2020. And that comes from uh, finance, all the person Schumacher. R90 2020 authorizing the city of Stoughton director of finance comptroller to act on the behalf of the city of Stoughton to accept the 2020 section 5310 grant in the amount of $30,359 and move forward with the process of purchasing an additional accessible van for the shared ride taxi program. So moved. Second. Second. Second by all the person was it Borsma? Borsma. Highly. Oh, Hiley. Both of them. okay. It's me. Holly will figure it me. out. She's good like that. Holly, it was me. All right. I'm gonna flip it over to Damon. Um, any questions on this? I think this is something we did maybe last year, and it's basically just a grant that our our investment is minimal, it comes out of CIP funds that we budgeted and tell them what I missed, Jamin. Nope, that's about it. It was budgeted in the CIP. Um, you know, we'll basically get a $38,000, $39,000 um, rear accessible van for our share ride taxi program for $8,000 out of pocket for the city. All right, any questions or comments? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed. That carries. Uh, next item, R91, comes from finance. All the person Schumacher. R91 2020, City of Stoughton declared a state of emergency due to the COVID-19 pandemic. This resolution suspends interest and penalties for late real property tax payments so long as the city receives full property tax payment by October 1, 2020. So moved. Second. Second. Second by all the person Reeves. Um, you want to walk us through this one, Brett or Jamin? Um, you know, you can see this one is based off of the the state act 185, um, where the municipalities can suspend interest and and penalties for real estate payments, and then that coincided with the emergency order number 12. So ultimately, we're doing what what we're supposed to be doing. Yeah, basically the state law says that we can do this as long as the county uh, authorizes a resolution and the local municipality does the same. I believe the county has already uh, approved theirs. And so we're asking for the same to, to give people the flexibility if they want to take advantage of this. 
Anything we missed, Jamin? No, that's about it. Um, you know, I apologize for a couple of these coming from finance to council immediately, but obviously timing's, timing is of the essence with this one. I think the county wanted the response back by June 15th. Um, there's really no impact to the city. Um, there's a little bit, there'll be a little bit of delay in the final cash flow, um, but the, the city will still be made whole on their tax collections. There will just be a delay in it. I have a question. Sure, go ahead, Sid. Uh, do, do special assessments uh, apply to this too? No. <laughs> no, this is, this is just tax levy. This is a property tax bill. Uh, the Finance Committee um, met earlier tonight and they did talk about um, some options as far as um, potentially trying to defer some special assessments. And uh, Jamin's team will continue to work on that. They've been working on that for a while now. And, and they are putting some different options together and they were looking for a little direction which I believe they received tonight at finance. So you'll probably see something on that at a future meeting. So that can't be incorporated tonight? No, this is a separate item because this is property tax and it's, it's based on a state statute that says the municipality and the county um, would have to do this for on the special assessment that would only be a municipal thing so we have to do that one on our own but we okay, are but i think we should it. i think we should we should address that yeah if you have any ideas on that certainly uh shoot jamin an email and he'll incorporate your ideas into what they're working on okay thank you thank you for thank you for bringing this forward jamin uh swiftly so that we can give people more flexibility. Yeah, um, I, I would take credit, but it's it's not mine. It, we're, I mean, we're just following the county's lead on this. Um, some municipalities actually implemented it earlier, contingent on the county, you know, passing this. So, um, I'm glad we're doing it. Thank you. Yeah, and a lot of this, you know, comes with our conversations with county officials, oh. including our county board member Chenoweth and and then county executive Parisi so a lot of these initiatives they've been really good at communicating to us what they're working on so we can piggyback on them so you know they get a lot of the credit and you know if we do our part um it's a win all around so um any other questions on this one hearing none all in favor say aye all right. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Adjourn. Motion second. by Maeski, a second? Second. 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 Reeves, any discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? We're adjourned. Thank you very much. Have a good night.